You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weeks. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. And today we are talking about the cards that you should pick up for your library for the 99 from Murders at Karlov Manor, the new detective-themed Ravnica also set. (laughs) Clues. Yeah, we're going to be talking about a lot of magic cards today. If you want to pick up any of those cards, you can do so while supporting the show at cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards. You can get exactly the card you're looking for and exactly the printing you're looking for. There's a lot of different versions of cards these days. If you want to be sure that all of your cards match and everything that's foil needs to be foil and isn't foil isn't foil... Go to Card Kingdom and you can buy all of those cards in one cart. It'll show up on your doorstep in one safe, well-packaged package. Uh, (laughs) Card Kingdom makes deck building super easy because you can get a huge chunk of your deck in one place. And you can do so while supporting the show at no extra charge to you. Again, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. And of course, once you get those cards, you want to protect them, go to ultrapro.com slash command. That is the game accessories company that uh, we trust our own collections to here at the Command Zone. If you want to get an awesome deck box, sleeves, play mats, maybe all three that match, not only do they match and look cool and are probably on the mystery clue theme of Murders at Karlov Manor, but also they're super high quality and will keep your game pieces protected, which is what we want out of our mm-hmm. sleeves, deck boxes, and play mats. Ultrapro.com slash command also is really cool because they have all kinds of discounts all the time, so you can often find a lot of good deals. Mm-hmm. I like to you check. just had a flash sale. Yeah. They do flash sales. They do limited stuff. They have secret layer drops. It is worth visiting quite often, honestly. I go there like once a week just to see what what's going on because you never know what you're going to find. So again, ultrapro.com slash command. Protect your cards. Make your battlefield look awesome. It's a win-win. Yeah. It's, it's value. Support the show. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a, there's even a third part of it. How can you turn this a three for one? <laughs> The final way to support the show directly is going over to Patreon at patreon.com slash command zone. All of our patrons get access to extra turns and game nights a day early without ads. Watch it before the world sees it. No spoilers for you. Plus, you can have uh, exclusive like conversations on our Discord with us and patrons about the game, about podcast episodes, about whatever magic conversations you want to have. You can talk directly to the hosts in our Discord. Uh, plus, we shout out one lucky patron every single podcast episode and this one is dedicated, dedicated to Devin Pierce. Devin, De- you rock. You definitely rock, Devin. Thanks for the support. All right, you know, this is one of my favorite episodes mm-hmm. to do every single set because the commanders are cool. Yeah. But if you don't build that commander deck, it's not that applicable to you, but right. it doesn't matter with the cards in the 99. You are going mm-hmm. to see those cards either you're going to play them or you're going to see them across the table from you. Absolutely. Yeah, and so and some sometimes you're going to see them a lot or you're going to want to play them a lot. Yeah, I mean, we're we're going to talk about some of the cards that you just need to know in case your opponents cast them so you're ready for them and then you can pick them up for whatever decks they're perfect in the you have. Yeah, if you um, see a cool legend, you want it you want one of it for the yeah. most part if you're going to build that deck. But sometimes you'll hear about a card in an episode like this and you're like I need 10 of those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, plus, uh, the cool thing about Murders at Karlov Manor is they, they took a lot of, like, classic cards and they just stapled Investigate to it. Yeah. Which is great in a very specific kind of deck that's super, super popular right now in these, like, junk rectangles decks. Rectangle theory. <laughs> Limited coming to Commander. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of sweet cards from the Murders of Color of Manor. I, there's a lot of really powerful cards for very powerful strategies. There's a lot of new cards for morph or disguise. There's like face up, face down cards. We're not really talking about those because those are super, super narrow. Again, we're talking about cards that you're more likely to sit down across from. So if you're building a morph deck, take a second look. There's a lot of cool cards. Yeah. You don't need us to tell us a or you don't need us to tell you to put like zombies in your zombie deck or yeah. zombie lords in your zombie deck. So, you know, face face up, face down mm. theme decks, look at the morph yeah. the morph and the cloak. Super stuff. specific or, clue cards, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Or, sorry, uh, disguise and cloak. Yes. Morph and manifest. Totally different things. Totally different. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's start off the bat here with uh 
a take on an old yeah uh, cycle of cards. We went back to the, it's it's Archmage's charm. Yeah, is I the think, blue one is that the first one. Uh, this is the green one. It's Archdruid's charm for green, green, green. It's an instant. Choose one. The first one is search your library for a creature or land card and reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield tapped if it's a land. Otherwise, put it into your hand then shuffle. The second one is put a plus one counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. And the third one is exile target artifact or enchantment the funny thing about this modal spell is it kind of has four options get a yeah. creature get a land the first one is two options so it options. tricks you a little bit yeah it just ramps you it doesn't put the land in your hand because that would be too bad for right. three mana yeah. i think so it's like a three mana rampant growth mm-hmm. or it's a three mana creature tutor mm-hmm. or it's a three mana fight spell yeah plus one plus one counter or it's a three mana naturalize right uh exile Oh, right. But yeah. But yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and and you're paying a little bit too much, I'd say, on any single one of those. Mm-hmm. It's like overcosted in every mode, but because it offers you four different modes, that the question becomes, is it worth it for the flexibility? Mm-hmm. Are you willing to pay the extra mana so that you can get, you know, because if I have a worldly tutor, there's only one thing I can do. Right. And if I need to kill a creature, that doesn't help me really do it. Although mm-hmm. maybe if I got a creature that fought another creature. Bad example. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so but, how do you view this card is, I guess, what I'm asking. I mean, it's it's very interesting because all of these are super, super relevant, right? But for me, when I look at a card, I need a reason to put it in into a deck. And modal spells are kind of tricky because you're like, yeah, I do all of those, but... I don't do, do any of them like, well. But I, yeah, but I, that's not like the best version of any of those cards. Yeah. So is it... it do, it's hard to earn its spot. What I would say about Archdruid's Charm is it searches for any land. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for specific lands in your deck, I think that is what would tip this over the top for me. It's like an instant speed Maze of a Tutor or something like that. Or, you know, if you've got Gaius Cradles or Nykthoses, or it looks like a Nykthos deck. It, it's that green, is green, significantly green. better because yeah. Urbor, Cabal Coffer. All of those are very There's good. a whole bunch. They do come in tapped. They come in tapped. It would be yeah. totally broken if they didn't, so they almost mm. had to do that. But yeah. So that's the one that I would be like, if I have specific lands that I'm after that I need on the battlefield, then I start looking at this card. And then, of course, you have to consider, can you cast it? Because green, green, green is a cost. Yeah. I mean, it's it's quite a cost. Mm -hmm. It's not like you can even count on casting this on three. And that's when you'd normally want to get the land mode is the Mm -hmm. earliest possible. Though not always, right? Guy's Cradle or something is worth it almost any time you can get it. Right. The instant changes it a lot too. Absolutely. Because it's an instant is the only reason I think you could consider it. So if it was a sorcery, it would be an absolute no for me. Mm -hmm. But flexibility is worth a lot more when added to the flexibility of instant speed. Uh, And I always say this with instants that are questionable, which it also has to do, I think, with the context of how many instants are already in your deck. Right. Because if this is one of only five instants or flash things you have in your deck, it becomes a lot worse. Right. Then instant speed doesn't really make that much of a difference. You're not going to want to hold up your mana because everything else in your deck is not an instant Mm -hmm. speed. But if you have 20 to 25 things in your deck that are instant speed, the flexibility on this becomes to be worth it because if you can't do this and this isn't a good idea, Mm -hmm. you have other options and you're just doing them all on the end step. So it's sort of all in the clear. And then you go, oh, nothing really scary happened. I'll go get my important land or I'll ramp with this, which Mm -hmm. is inefficient, but... Because it's in a safe spot, because I know, you know, I've got, it's the end step before my turn, that makes it a little bit better. Because, mm-hmm. boy, pay green, 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 even though it's got this mode for exile target enchantment or artifact is like bad. Yeah. I, the thing I was thinking about is you look at this and you're like, well, it goes in mono green decks or heavy green, like other, like splash something else decks. But in in my mind, I, I feel like if you're that heavy green, you're going to have a really tough time finding a deck that that is comfortable casting this. I think the place that I would look at it the most is treasure decks. Mm. Like if you're in two or three color treasure decks and like, cause treasures fix you. So green, green, green isn't a cost. It's just three treasures right. or two treasures or something right. like that. And that goes very well with the instant speed stuff because now treasures sort of mean that you always have mana open is kind of how I found that treasures play. It's like gives you one big turn, and then it means you always have like two or three mana open. Yeah, um, and, and it's not weird. It's not like you hold it open because if you don't use it, you've saved it for later since right. they're one-time use. Mm. And this is kind of a, in an emergency, 
break the glass. Exactly. <laughs> and it exactly. might be to fight. It might be to exile an enchantment or artifact. And yeah. it might be to go get a land or, or get that perfect creature. But yeah, treasures kind of give you more flexibility. That's interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a really good point about mono green being less flash speed than sort of instant speed. Mm-hmm. Generally, right? Want to cast your creatures. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So you generally do play a sorcerer speed m- the more closer you are to mono green. So that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I... I I don't think we'll actually see this one that much. I think it's probably a little bit too inefficient. That's my guess. Yeah. I, I think that's reasonable. We don't see much of Archmage's Charm, even though all of those are hypothetically pretty good modes for us. Right. Um, so I think that says a lot about this spell. And that's, you know, blue, which is used to moving at flash speed and likes instants and sorceries. So. Yeah. Um, but, but go find a creature at instant speed is pretty powerful. It's pretty good. And I You're think like, that's probably more powerful than any of the modes on the mm-hmm. blue one. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that alone kind of... And then... Like we said, tutoring a land or a creature. I don't know. that That's a little bit better. So it, it I'm on mm-hmm. the fence. Like, I think we will see it a little bit. Yeah. I could see you hold this up for interaction. And you're like, oh, nobody went off. Cool. I'm going to go tutor for- like Get my I'm best creature go, or my yeah, best land. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. We're going to move on to the next green card, but in alphabetical order. So, you know. <laughs> was that coincidence? Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, these are cases. Right. All oh, right. So this is our first uh, time talking about a case on this episode. Have you talked about them on the pre-con episodes? We haven't. I, I don't think there's, there. there's like maybe one or two cases. Okay. But, um, so cases are kind of like sagas a little bit. And ish, the way yeah. they work is they come in, they have an effect, and then you have to meet a condition, and then you solve them, and they kind of give you an an anthem or mm. a, I wouldn't say an emblem because they can still get rid of the enchantment once they it's been gain salt. an ability. Right. Yeah. They so, remind me a little bit of like classes, like paladin class and that Oh, interesting. Kind of thing. Instead of paying simple. mana, I have to meet some kind of condition. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is case of the locked hothouse. It's three inner green. Its static ability is you may play an additional land on each of your turns. Okay. For four mana, that's a lot. Yeah. So it's a four mana explore. Oh, well, it's a four mana exploration. Exploration. Yeah. Explore, yeah, exploration. But it says, to solve, you control seven or more lands. That's pretty easy. Yeah. So this is the reminder text. If unsolved, solve at the beginning of your end step. Uh, so it's not at the moment you have seven lands. It checks on unstep all your cases and says, did you solve this one? How about this one? How about this one? So if on your end step you have seven lands and this in play, then it becomes solved and it says, you may look at the top card of your library at any time and you may play lands and cast creatures and enchantment spells from the top of your library. And it still keeps the you may play an additional land on each of your turns. So yeah. it just gains an additional mode. This is a really interesting card because I think when you first look at it, you're like, oh, it's like Oracle of Moldiah. But it's not quite like Oracle of Moldiah. I don't think it's that close, but yeah. Because like, you, like you, it has you're similar like, words on it. Four mana, these are all the same things. Yeah. Cash from the top, that's great. But Oracle of Moldiah, you reveal the top, it's a land, play a land. You reveal the top, it's a land, play a land. And you do that the turn you play it. The n- yeah, as soon as it comes down. Yeah. This one, you cast, you play an extra land from your hand if you have it when you have four mana, which you is not always two. guaranteed. Yeah. yeah, like that you actually get value out of that additional land drop after yeah. having four mana. And then on your next turn, you start moving off the top of your library. If you have... What probably happens is you hit your fourth land drop, cast this, mm. play your fifth land drop. Right. And then your next turn, you play your sixth and your seventh. If you had three lands in hand when you played this, or we're looking to draw one, Mm. uh, and then you solve it, and the next turn you get to do the oracle thing of look at the top of the library. We didn't mention also, this will allow you to cast creatures and enchantments off the top, which oracle does not allow you to do. And enchantments Mm -hmm. is actually the sort of novel one, right? Right. That's the interesting thing about this card to me, is we're pretty used to being able to cast creatures off the top of our library at this point. Like Elven Chorus just got reprinted. Augur of Autumn does this pretty well. But enchantments, they have not really allowed this ability. And enchantresses can really, really go hard. So... I think this card, if it's worth it, is worth it in an Enchantress deck. It's an enchantment itself, and it sets you up for a huge like Enchantress storm turn, basically. Yeah. Makes a ton of sense to me because Enchantress decks draw a ton of cards, so they're mm-hmm. likely to have a lot of lands in hand. Right. So 
have reduction this, on casting this. Yeah, they're like, cast this, draw a card, drop a land, cast another enchantment, draw another card, next mm-hmm. turn, easy to hit my two land drops, you know. And this just is worth it as an enchantment and also mm-hmm. just happens to, you know, let me cast enchantments from the top of my library, which is nice too. Yeah, if you happen to run out of enchantments after casting all of the stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're, you're drawing a lot of cards already. It's kind of tough to justify with the amount of really good effects that we have like this. I think Elven Chorus is going to be better than this in most decks. Yeah, I believe so as well. Uh, it's an interesting one though. It and is I, And cool. it makes me wonder if they're going to allow green to play enchantments off the top of the library mm. is that a new thing that they have just decided green gets to do yeah like it seems like white should be the one that gets to play enchantments off the top of the library like why yeah. don't we give that to white like hey yeah. green you're fine you're, you, you can cast creatures off the and top creatures yeah and you have all the enchantresses yeah so and, <laughs> and we know red and blue they get to do instants yeah. and sorceries off the top so mm-hmm. it makes sense to me that white should get something and it's Enchantments are artifacts, right? Like, yeah. those are the things. They did give one recently to White in the set, actually, that lets you cast little creatures off the top. Yeah, it's they're going with power, two power two or less. less. But yeah. you're like, I can't make a whole deck based on two power or less. Yeah. That's not like enchantments. <laughs> I sor- it's like I sort of wish that um, they would have allowed White to ramp with only planes mm-hmm. and had uh, Green be the one that can ramp with other lands. Yeah. Like, I think there's some nuance there, but it just makes me a little sad that they're like, the rich get richer here. Who yeah. should get to play enchantments off the top of the library? Well, also that should green. obviously be green. They're also drawing you know. cards when they cast enchantments. They can do everything. They so can, yeah. <laughs> doesn't seem fair. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Um, okay. It's cool. I wish we were talking about more cases. There are some really sweet cases. They're just super narrow. There's like an instance and sorceries one that's There's cool. There's a five color one. There's a five color one that's pretty cool. There's like a, a white one that deal is removal, but then lets you cast little creatures from your graveyard. You're just not going to see as much of those because they're very, very narrow. They're narrow. It's pretty obvious when you want to play it. If you have a five yeah. color commander, you want to play the five color one. Not if it, the five color commander is like Kenrith though. It has yeah. to have five colors, five colors and it's like yeah. cost or beat. Yeah. Okay. All right, I had this next one in a limited deck, and it was really good. It seems busted. (laughs) It was nuts. It's called Connecting the Dots. This is an enchantment for one in a red. Whenever a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down. You cannot look at it. Then one in a red, discard your hand, sacrifice Connecting the Dots, put all cards exiled with Connecting the Dots into their owner's hands. Some weird wording there, just in case somebody gains control of your enchantment. You have to go into the and then, So yeah. you can't go into all That would be <laughs> sweet if you could steal this and steal their cards, though. <laughs> steal all their cards. Yeah. Uh, so what this is, it's a Bomad Courier, for those who are familiar with Bomad Courier, for all of your creatures, which is extremely powerful. <laughs> and also, the ability itself, the Bomad Courier, part of the problem was... The Bomak Courier itself is not that hard to kill. Right. It's really difficult to find a clean attack with this thing, especially in Commander. Yeah. But this is an enchantment that holds all the cards. Mm -hmm. A lot more difficult to get rid of. And at the point you're ready to get rid of it, if they have two mana open, you can't even try. Yeah. And it triggers per creature. Bomak Courier is only going to get one card every attack. This is like, you could slam connecting the the dots, attack with four creatures, XL four cards underneath this. And basically draw four. And basically draw those four. I I mean, you're going to have to discard your hand, but hypothetically you dump your hand onto the battlefield, attack with it, draw a whole bunch more cards with this. Yeah. That's the, how it played in Limited was it would be like, put it out there, attack with two creatures, get two cards under it. Next turn, attack with four creatures, mm-hmm. get f- six. And there's six cards under it now, and you're like, yeah, I'm just going to discard my two cards and draw six. Draw Thank six. you. That yeah. seems good. That seems pretty great. Yeah. And it, in Commander, it could be 20. Yeah. Although easily. if you attack with 20 creatures, you probably won. Yeah, I mean, if you have 20 creatures, you're doing pretty good. It's <laughs> What I like about this is it says that you can't overcommit to the board, kind of. Like, the problem with red and white, especially red and white aggro, is you want to get a lot of creatures onto the board to deal a lot of damage, but if you put a bunch of creatures on the board, you're going to lose them to a board wipe. Yeah. And this says, like, you put a bunch of creatures on the board, good job, we're going to give you cards to replace those. Yeah. As long as you're using them, you know? So I, I really like that this is a little bit of board wipe protection and lets you rebuild after that. The thing is, after a certain point, you cannot tap out. Yeah. Uh, you hold you, up the two man at all times. Forever. Yeah. yeah. Because once it's got at least probably like seven. Yeah. I mean, I honestly, once your card positive under there, I'm holding mana up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, just, I just am. It is also just good if you want things in graveyards. Yeah. It's a wheel. Yeah. So like it could even wheel. be like, yeah, I'm drawing a lot of cards, but once I have like, you know, seven, eight on there, even mm-hmm. if I have seven eight in hand, that's just a get seven things into my graveyard and still have a hand. Yeah. Yeah. 
I the thing that I really like about this because I'm a white player is it's a on a permanent, so it's really really easy to recur. Yeah. It looks like you crack it once and you do, you do the thing and you're like, great, I have seven new hands. New I have seven new hands. Wow. Oh my god. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I can slap you silly. <laughs> Uh, I have some new cards. <laughs> but with stuff like Savin's Reclamation or Sun Titan, you can bring Underworld this Breach. back. Underworld Breach. You can keep yeah. reusing this and it can sort of fuel your whole game. It does feel unlikely you're going to attack with enough creatures in a game to reuse this more than like once though. Yeah, I, you use it twice yeah, probably. Yeah, uh, I know in Rachel World you're like, you know. Forever! I attack with five creatures every turn and yeah. I do that for four consecutive turns. Yes. And I'm like, Rachel, in your world, which I live in, we, de- we dead. We dead already. Yeah, Stop drawing the cards. Second, the second time you did that, we died. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm just holding all these cards. <laughs> but I can't use my seven hands. My seven hands. <laughs> Uh, it's also sick with Lurus, uh, oh, which yeah. I was thinking of. I was like, oh, oh God. It's so good because it puts the things in there, too. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, cool. Yeah, I think this is going to be quite powerful. Mm. Yeah. And and we'll, and with the two power theme we see coming in, we'll kind of work well with that because that's going to get things out on the board early. Mm. So, yeah, I like this card a lot. Very cool. This next card's a bit of a doozy. A humdinger. It has... Uh, What's a cutie? It's caused... Yeah, it's very cute. It's caused a little bit of uh, online discussion, you mm. might say. A little bit of discourse. It is Crime Novelist. Yeah, it is a very cute little goblin who is writing a novel. <laughs> He's a goblin it author. Might, yeah, it might be a horror novel, though. It's two and a red for a 1-3 creature goblin bard. Whenever you sacrifice an artifact, put a 1-1 counter on crime novelist and add red to your mana pool. Oh, it's beardy for artifacts. Oh, my lord. Yeah, I mean... So this is like the second line on a gold span dragon, basically, right? It's like your treasures. Crack for two is like what everybody looks at and sees immediately. It's actually better than that, though. It's better than that. Not because of the one-one counters, which also makes it better. Right. It's because it works for any time you sacrifice an artifact. So those clues? Now they cost one to crack. Well, two and then one. You get a rebate. And then one, yeah. you get a rebate. (laughs) It's pretty good. Also, like, hey, those scrap trawler, mm-hmm. you know, mirror retriever loops that people like to do. Yeah, you thought you, you know, went infinite. Who then. likes to do? Yeah, <laughs> boy. That some people like yeah, to play. That, you know, some <laughs> degenerates <laughs> like to do. Yeah, that's just that becomes a lot easier to pull off. Actually, I think it'll probably be net better for all the people playing against the scrap trawler players because mm. they won't have to think so hard. Yeah, now they have infinite red. Yeah, and like, well, I like, get a man every time, so I don't have to think that much. This gets infinitely big. A Chandra's ignition? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good? We good? I don't know. We done here? That was a win con. <laughs> yeah, uh, food. Like, there's all these decks now, and mm. this is, a, again, rectal- rectangle theory, which we talked about earlier, which... We mentioned in a podcast, I don't know, a few weeks ago, but um, I think the Lords of Limited guys are the ones that I heard it from the first time. Mm-hmm. I think they invented it, which is this idea that, you know, cards are good if they create other rectangles on the board for you. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of that now. Create a food, create a, a clue, create a treasure, you know, academy manufacturer, make all of those, mm-hmm. like do all that. And, you know, make a thopter, make those count, right? Like anything yep. you've got. And if you're sacrificing a thopter to an altar, Ashnod's altar, that's going to make a red, extra red mana when mm-hmm. you do that. They all represent resources. Yeah. And I believe that this idea of like cards that, cr- that give you an extra cardboard, you know, rectangle mm-hmm. plays right into what crime novelist wants you to do as well. Yes. So. This is definitely a... This is, to me, it represents like an artifact storm type of yeah. build. Like this looks at the decks that are like, okay, I'm going to crack all my treasures in one turn and I'm going to sack all these clues and I'm going to drain the table for this many and I'm going to draw this many cards. And it's a one big turn because you don't get the rebate until after it's happened. So you want it, it sort of makes you want to do it again. Yeah. If you're going to do it, you want to do it all at once. Right. Just um, by the nature of how these cards work. Right. So it, it really says that like, okay, my deck is designed to have one huge combo turn, probably a combo turn. I don't think this is as good as a value piece. It, it doesn't have to be an infinite combo turn though. Yeah. That's what we've learned with Absolutely. the Burgies and the Storm Kiln Artist, which I think is very close. It'll just allow you to do so much that, mm. you know, maybe you're never in a loop where you actually demonstrate the loop and like I go infinite now, but it's like, I do this, I, get, I net a red, mm. I do this, I net a red, I do this, I net a red. You know, technically, I could run out of gas here, but I'm going to do it enough times that I end up with 27 red, and that's enough to win. I don't yeah. need it. I don't need infinite. Yeah, 27 red usually wins the game. <laughs> yeah, usually will win. Um, yeah. 
I there's a couple of sweet commanders with this that I wanted to mention, but like basically any commander that says create a token that you that you sacrifice blood tokens, clues, food, oh, treasures. Blood, blood tokens are so good with it because they only cost one. To it crack only costs anyway. one to crack, so, so it's they're free, free to crack. Ooh, that's it's re- good. It's really sweet. Now I want to put this in a blood deck. I know. I really like blood tokens. I wish we, I, I hope we see more of them. Brea is really good in because you can sacrifice two artifacts, so you get that mana back immediately. Do again? Jeez. Yan Jansen was the one that I thought of because it sacrifices artifact creatures and makes treasures, and then it then sacrifices sac those. those to make construct. So, and it's for free. So now you're up mana every time you activate this, yeah, which that- seems absurd. Yeah, I think the problem with Crime Novelists, I wish they costed it more because three mm-hmm. mana is too, too easily allow you to play it the turn you you go off. Absolutely. And it would be nice if the play pattern. Goldspan is actually sits in a decent spot. Mm-hmm. I think it's a very good card, but it doesn't feel incredibly broken because you can't even start to do the thing until you have the five mana cast Goldspan. Right, yeah. And that's just a little bit late enough that like you have to wait because you have to cast gold pan then have enough resources left to start the chain going mm. crime novel this it feels like it's gonna be very easy to start the chain going because it only costs three yeah and most of the time you're gonna be cracking a treasure to get it started anyway so now you're up two mana and and here we go here we go yeah uh there is a new commander that it can do loop de dupes with basically is Krenko, a baron of tin street this is a cool card. It's two and a red uh, for a goblin with haste. It says tap, sack an artifact, put a plus one counter on each goblin you control. Seems good. And then whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay red. If you do, create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token. It gains haste until end of turn. Now, anytime you sacrifice an artifact, you can it gives you get, you get a free them. goblin, basically. So now there's obviously loops you can do <laughs> with uh, <laughs> sacking goblins to altars and sacking treasures to make goblins. I just want to know why somebody over there at Wizard said, you know what Krenko's always needed? A ben- hey, haste. Hey, haste. Yeah, haste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Haste. yeah. Haste. To like immediately make yeah. all your goblins Yeah, that's, bigger. you know, he just that's always like- needed that. Who's never good enough before, but now he's got haste, so <laughs> Uh, predictably, uh, there are infinite combos with Crime Novelist. Um, the biggest sort of engine with it is Animation Module, because that's any time you put a counter on something, mm-hmm. you can pay one and you make an artifact. Yep. So now all you need is a sack outlet with that and you're already exactly. going. Yeah. yeah. So a Goblin Bombardment will say, okay, sack the artifact, make it red, put a counter on it, use the red to make another thing. So now you have infinite damage. Infinite one pings. Yeah. And that's, you that's know. pretty good. That's a three card combo yeah. that are all good cards. Uh, obviously, if you use. Uh, by the way, the total cost of those cards is yeah. uh, six mana. Six mana. Counting <laughs> the crime novelist. No problem. Those are all in your hand. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to show any to anybody. Uh, you just have to have six mana and a treasure. That seems okay. That seems okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You do need some way to start that loop. Six mana and yeah. one uh, thing to sack, I yeah. think, would do it. Kirkland Ironworks gives yep. you, now you have infinite mana, which you kind of already, <laughs> if you have KCI, you probably already have infinite mana, but, you know. You get colored mana, though, red. That's true. Now you have infinite red yeah. and infinite colorless. Yeah. This is all already sort of an almost infinite combo is Thopter Foundry and Sword of the Meek. Let's you sacrifice a sword to make a Thopter, brings the sword back attached to the Thopter. But usually it costs you one mana to make a Thopter. Now you get the red mana back. So now you can make infinite Thopters. Yep. And you can have the Sword of the Meek and enter infinite times. So uh, that is a four card color combo, but a very powerful one indeed. And there are undoubtedly many, many more once you get to about four cards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, th- th- these kind of things already go infinite. Yeah. I think it just has to be viewed like Storm Kiln Artist, like Bergy, like those kind of cards, which is, first of all, if you ever, they ever show it to you, you have to kill it. Mm-hmm. You'll, you will die to it when they untap. And probably at a cer- if you know they have it in their deck at a certain point in time, you have to be ready that it's going to come down and they'll try and go off with it. Yeah. I think the interesting thing about this card is very powerful in very powerful strategies. So it feels like to me, most of the time if you put this card in, it's gonna be win more. Like if you have a bunch of treasures to to double, you're already pretty good. You already have a lot of mana. So it's definitely an accelerant, but on its own, it does nothing. And you need to be careful when you're building your deck not to fill it with cards that do nothing. But how many treasure makers do you need in your deck before this is good? Or how many clues? I think clues, you want it on Or the how many zone. food? Or how many blood? I think you literally want a, the commander that does it. Otherwise, I'm concerned I draw it and it's dead. Yeah, I would I would say if I'm a treasure theme thing mm-hmm. and I know I've got, let's say I've got 20 cards in my deck that are going to create a treasure, or yeah. a clue of blood or something, right? Yeah, that's a lot. But yeah. Then yeah, then I, I think you can do it. Or that it's, is in, probably or it's in your command zone. Yeah. One of the two. But 
It's a. Uh, it's you just have to if be careful. If KCI's in your deck, then you put this in though, because sure. that tells you this is the my kind deck's of already doing that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, the next one is demand answers. I want the truth. <laughs> you can't handle the truth. Okay, demand answers one in red for an instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice an artifact or discard a card and then draw two cards. So this is Thrill of Possibility, but it has the mode of sacrifice an artifact instead of losing an actual card, mm-hmm. which is quite a bit better, honestly. I think it's just better. Yeah, sack of food or a Like, treasure. obviously, it's strictly better, right? Like, it just has other words and there's no additional downside. Yeah, it's yeah. just strictly better. It just is better, you're right. Yeah. So but it's it, a lot better. Like, a treasure is good, but it's not worth a card. So mm-hmm. if you can turn a treasure into a card, you would almost always want to do it. I would even trade, like, an Arcane Signet for a card in the late game yeah. half the time. You know, if I'm playing Mono Red or even a deck that's just out of gas... <laughs> now, how many times have you cracked your Mind Stone, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, this feels like exactly that moment where you're like, I would kill for more cards. I have all the mana I need. I just need to see more pieces, which makes Demand Answers really er- good in the early game. When you have a spare card, you want to get it in the bin, which is most of the time why you're running through a thrill of possibility. And then in the late game, when you're like, I already have my graveyard is full. I just need more cards. You can get rid of any artifact and draw two cards. Yeah. If, if it at least didn't have the discard a card, you could make the argument that like sometimes you want a specific card in the bin and it wouldn't have that mode. And this would be like yeah. sometimes better, sometimes worse. But you but also have that. No, but you can just, they were like, <laughs> you nah, just also do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this just strictly replaces thrill of possibility and it probably pushes tormenting voice out entirely which is the sorcery speed one that was what i was thinking is you just have both thrill and demand but yeah. tormenting voice we just don't see anymore yeah basically uh because like if you're gonna play tormenting voice you might as well play cathartic reunion most of the time yeah. which is discard two draw three that can be a little hard because every once in a while you're low on cards mm-hmm. and you just don't have three yeah, cards you don't have two to bit yeah, to yeah that's for sure. that's been my finding with cathartic it's very good when you can do it but every once in a while you're like crap i have to wait to draw another card to you know get my three cards out of this yeah Demanding answers, very good. And it's not just good in artifact decks. You're in red. You have artifacts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they go to remove something, right? Yeah. All right, I'll sack that thing. Yeah. You were going to kill it anyway. Might as well. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It Then it plays like Deadly Dispute. It feels like Deadly Dispute to That's me. That's interesting. I didn't think of it that way. The other thing you can do is sack mana vaults if you have a tapped mana oh, vault yeah. or sack basalt monoliths or something like that you just have a tapped useless something on the board. Yeah. There's a lot of utility in demand answers that I think uh, we'll find as we go. Okay. And then you get a mana from crime novelist when you do it too. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> it's a combo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this next card is wild. It is expedited inheritance. Red, red for an enchantment. Whenever a creature is dealt damage, any creature, its controller may exile that many cards from the top of their library. That many being the amount of damage it's dealt. They may play those cards until the end of their next turn. This is a two-mana enchantment with the potential to exile 20 cards? 30 cards? <laughs> yeah, what? So if they swing at you with a 10-10 yeah. and you block with a 1-1, because this is a creature. A creature. So you would exile 10 off the top of your library and they would exile 1. Is if they attack you with a 10-10, yeah. yes. Yeah. And you block with a 1-1. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so... The Making fun- my brain hurt, yeah. The funky thing about this card is I can't figure out where exactly, like, if it's good for aggro decks or if it's bad for aggro decks. Do you know what I, like, that's, yeah. that's the sort of That's what I was like, where does the me. advantage lie? So, there's definitely, well, let, let's talk about a couple of things. I want to mention this up, up top. You can negate the downside with a Dranith Magistrate. Yeah, they can't uh, play things from exile, so ta da! <laughs> so you get your cards, and they don't. Get and theirs. they don't get yeah. their cards. There you go. Uh, if you're running Dranith Magistrate, the, it's a combo. Um, <laughs> Everyone hates you already, anyway. Yeah, I know. Like you might They're as like, well. Oh, I can't cast my commander. Yeah, you Who might. Cares about the impulse draw. <laughs> they don't have to exile. That's another big thing I didn't mention. Is they may exile, so you can't. can't uh, you mi- can't deck an opponent with a blasphemous act or something. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, it would be cool. Probably too good though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, but getting into the, the weeds on the aggro thing, it is really strange. Like, if you're attacking, if I if I have a 2-2, two, two, uh, this thing's on the board. I have a 2-2, two, two, I'm attacking you. You have a 3-3. Three, three. Do you block? Wow. That's a free block for you. I think you do. Yeah. If it's a 2-2 two, two versus a 3-3. Three, three. But yeah. there's, there's got to be a point where it's like it's a 4-4. Four, four. Right. It's a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah. It's a 6-6. Six, six. 
Somewhere in there, the answer is no. The answer is no. Yeah. Right. Three is like, okay. Yeah. Uh, I get, get two. I get two. You, you get, get three, three. And you lose a creature. You lose your creature, so you lose that mana. Right. So, like, yeah. But if it's. But, but yeah. Is if I have an four, eight, eight? It's definitely not eight. You can't yeah. let them impulse draw eight. Yeah. For their two, two? Like, yeah. of course. Yeah. I don't know where the line is, but it definitely. So I don't. Hmm. So it, at a certain point, it becomes. <laughs> it becomes, like, unblockable. <laughs> If you attack with a 1-1 one, one, and they have, like, free blocks on you, it becomes a lot more difficult to block, like, little creatures. And it becomes a lot easier to block big creatures. I don't even know how to think about this card. Like, yeah. how do you create an advantage from this? Goad seems bad, right? Because then your opponents are hitting each other. Yeah. And, and they're blocking. impulse drawing, but you're not. Yeah, that doesn't seem That right. doesn't seem good. But do you really want to encourage people to have to attack you? You really want people to have to block you. Yeah. Can you so, force blocks? Is it good with like lures and stuff in green? Like how are you, because you want the disparity to be big. So you want right. to set up situations where two things are causing damage to each other mm. and the thing you've got has very small power and the thing they've got has high power, right? Mm. Like That's like, what it seems like. Like, in like defender a, stuff? Like a small. <laughs> then they don't attack you though. If, yeah, then they just don't attack you. It feels like if you're attacking with like 10 goblins, now they just take 10. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Instead of giving you six cards or something like that. But at a certain point, they have to block because they won't just die. Right, because it. then they're taking a bunch of damage. So it does allow you to get an extra damage, which yeah. maybe is useful, but like there's a point at which they're like, okay, now I have to block. Mm. And then like you're going to get some extra cards though, and maybe that's enough. Yeah. I. It's very, very interesting in an aggro deck. I was thinking about it in a deck that can ping things. It's like a Tim deck? It's kind of like a Tim deck. Interesting. But yeah. the problem is, Tim deck wants to ping. Other things, but Other you things. could ping yourself, you I could guess. Ping your, you could ping your own creatures. You got to be careful because Tims are little, I guess. But but usually there's a commander that yeah. has, you know, I run like Ludovic and yeah. stuff. And the, you ping it once or twice. Yeah. That's interesting. Start impulse drawing And cards. it says until the end of your next turn. Next turn so you can actually take advantage of damage wearing off and be like, okay, on your end step, I ping it. Then on the next end step, I ping it. Uh, yeah. I'm putting it in my Tim deck. Good, good, Sweet. Thought, good, good idea. <laughs> yeah, uh, I like that. Defiler of Instinct is the one I thought of because you can use, now you can pay life to cast some of those cards uh, that you're exiling and you can ping your own stuff with it. Every time you cast a spell, you like throw damage, right? Yeah, it deals one damage to any target. Mm -hmm. So, you, can Every ping, time you, so you, you cast a red spell, you ping your thing, an impulse draws you, yeah. you pay life to cast it. You cast it, you ping one of your things. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, that seems good. <laughs> <laughs> so... The more I thought about it, the more I was like, okay, so it, it feels like a, it's a non-creature damage type of card, but you need to be able to take advantage of having a huge amount of cards. Mm -hmm. I think that's the big deciding factor here is you need some, like you need to benefit from having 30 cards versus like two or three extra. You know what I mean? Until your next turn too. You don't get to hold them in your hands. So you exactly. gotta be able to use them right away. Yeah. So what does that even look like? Is that like a storm deck? But that it's, storm deck doesn't yeah. have a lot of creatures. Yeah. Then you need like blasphemous acts and burn spells and that kind of thing. Oh, so if you had a token deck mm. and you blasphemous act, you draw th impulse draw 13 off each one or you could. You could. Yeah. So you're like, oh, I'm only going to impulse 26 off these two yeah. and the rest will just die. There's got to be something there. I mean, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you Blasphemous Act with, with like, six creatures on board and then just find your Thassa's Oracle and that stack of uh, cards oh, you just you can't exiled, cast it. now you're just, boop, Thassa's Oracle? You don't even need that many creatures. You only need, like, yeah, six. Like six? Yeah, because that's 60, 78, yeah. and you've yeah. drawn some amount. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, the thing about this card is it is dangerous. It's hard to break, like, in, yeah, it's but hard it to find is. the path of how to break it. But it's really powerful. <laughs> Some people out there are going to figure that out, yeah. <laughs> I would assume if this card comes down, I should be very scared of it. Yes, but I don't. Sure. I can't right now predict why. And you shouldn't put it in a deck unless it's really scary, for sure. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it's fun to put it in a deck and be like, I don't know, this card seems cool, but I have no Let's idea. Let's see. Yeah. I, uh, the other thing that we should mention is it's really good in uh, cast room exile decks. If you mm. can get additional oh, yeah. uh, benefit from from the cards you're casting from exile, uh, or even if you have like a Rocco Street Chef deck where you're getting benefit from your opponents casting stuff from exile, now we're talking. What's that like white flyer that you really like that whenever somebody casts something from exile? Oh yeah, Sarah says yeah. If you have that in your deck, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boy, can I not think of that right now? It's the one that like when it comes in, it like exiles something. Yeah. But they can cast it. But it, now every time when your opponent yeah, casts it's something, it's a bird. From exile, yeah. It's I don't know. You played against me a lot, but it's, it's really good. Yeah. 
That would be good with this. Prosper, obviously. Yeah. Because yeah. now you're saying, okay, everyone's going to get some impulse draw, but mm. I get additional advantage from right. that, whereas you just, you know, get the cards. The coolest one I could think of was Commander Liara Porter, which is a, a card I'm really high on. It's a five mana, five three. Whenever you attack, spells you cast from exile this turn cost X less to cast, where X is the number of players being attacked. Exile the top X cards of your library until end of turn you may cast spells from among those exiled cards. So it impulse mm-hmm. draws you three cards and then it reduces up to three the casting cost of your spells in any exile up to three. So now you're like, okay, cast this uh, rock for free, this rock for free, this rock for free, this rock for free. Yeah, and I impulse draw 20, so. Yeah, but you're saving a huge amount of mana on it. That's pretty sweet. So that seems like a perfect place for it. This card uh, is wild. I'm obsessed with it. It's very cool. Yeah. This next one, they they did a good job with some of the design on some of these where it is kind of, you have to do a, quite a bit of thinking to figure out Exactly how good it is. The next one's kind of like that, too. Absolutely. Yeah, it's called Final Word Phantom. Two and a blue for a 1-4 spirit detective with flash and flying. Mm -hmm. And it says, during each opponent's end step, you may cast spells as though they had flash. Oh, it's flashy. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, uh, yeah, Vidalcan Orrery Phantom. It's it's Vidalcan Orrery. It's probably better than Vidalcan Orrery. I I agree. <laughs> so there's some interesting upsides to this card. You've talked at length about what's good about about playing at flash speed. Yeah. This, and this does take away some of what's good about it. Right. Um, the most notable thing is that when you have, when you can play at flash speed, you have a Dalkinori or a lane line out mm. and you are completely untapped. If Rachel's playing against you and she wants to attack you, mm. she has to worry about what creatures you could flash out to block that she can't see. Mm. So you have like a lot of your power obfuscated. So this won't give you that because it's only during the end step. Right. But most of what's good about Vidalcanori is the ability to obfuscate your power in the manner of I do things on end step before my turn Mm -hmm. or in between turns after I've gained more information. So it allows me to push my decision point down to a point at which I've seen more, I've learned more. I can Mm -hmm. see what you do before I act. So if I don't know if, you know, I I would like to cast this creature, but I'm scared because the creature taps out all of my mana and Rachel looks a little bit scary and might do stuff and I might want to hold my counter spell open. Well, this will still kind of solve that problem for you because you go... Rachel didn't make me counter anything. I will flash out this creature. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. You can still kind of do that here. You couldn't flash out to block, but you could still get it out in time for your next turn if nothing else scarier happened. Right. The other thing that I really like about playing at flash speed is it looks like you're a turn behind. Yeah, but you're actually a turn ahead. But you're actually a turn ahead. Uh, Because on board you're like physically a turn a turn behind. So everybody looks at your board and goes, eh. and then you're like, he, 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 sneak up. Well, you just take two turns in a row and yeah. quickly jump ahead, right? Exactly. You're like, oh, I'm one turn behind. On your end step, I make up for that turn. Now I untap, and now I'm a t- if I do mm-hmm. stuff now, I'm actually jumping ahead, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's super, super tricky, and it really lightens up the load of like, Vidal Canorri feels really bad to tap out for yeah. and pat and then get your value next rotation. This means that you never have to do that, which is really nice. Well, yeah, notably Vidal Canorri does not have flash itself. Right. So it doesn't give you the flexibility to play it, you know, when you've the coast is clear. Mm-hmm. Whereas Final Word Phantom, it's a totally different story. Yeah. Because you get to, you know, just hold your mana open and again, gonna be better when you have more instants in your deck. But off you skate that power and then say, okay, cool, on the end step before my turn, flash this out, untap, go. Yeah. And they're like, crap, I never had a moment there to take advantage of the fact that you kind of tempoed your, yourself by playing a card mm-hmm. that, you know, doesn't do a lot. And, and even then, this is a 1-4 flyer with flash, so it can actually, like, block their Ragavan or something, too, which is totally relevant. Yeah. Yeah. 1-4 is a, is a solid blocker, especially at flash speed. I'm super excited about this card because I've mentioned that Vidalconori is one of my favorite cards of all time, and we used to talk about it a lot, mm-hmm. and we've stopped talking about it because, you you know, in honesty, like, it's hard to play anymore. Four mana is just not a good spot mm-hmm. to do nothing. There's, 
you know, the format's just sped up. And I don't like that any more than other people. They hate when I say that, like, I've caused this to happen. Mm. But, you know, that's just what happens when more cards enter the format, right? Things have become more optimized and efficient. And that's a natural progression. I think that's totally fine. But I'm really excited that, like, oh, cool, now I can get this effect and I think it's playable again. That's going to mm. be fun. Like, I'm going to get to do the thing I like. Yeah. It's a little bit different, but it's close enough. Yeah. Yep. I, I think it's really sweet. I'm going to try it in Feldergriff. Yep. Uh, the other thing I wanted it's to mention. Annoying, with it, Yeah, it is. I like it when I do it, not it's when you do it. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention that it's really good with rule of law effects that say you can only cast one spell each turn. Mm. So now you can cast four spells. And, and they're screwed. And they can cast one. Ooh, that's brutal. And that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, there's a blue one even. It's called Arcane Laboratory. Uh, and it just... <laughs> It'll be really annoying, but it's pretty sweet. That's very sweet. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to move on to another powerful card here. Woo. That was a good one. I was afraid that it was went around. Get caught on the table. Yeah, that boomeranged. Uh, hey, it's another, years of practice. Years of practice. Yeah. <laughs> another powerful blue three drop. This is Forensic Gadgeteer. Uh, this is two and a blue for a two three Vidalcan Artificer Detective. Got a lot of jobs. Yeah. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, investigate. Mm. Whoa. Activated abilities of artifacts you control cast one l cost one less to activate. Whoa. This effect can reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. <laughs> it seems very good. Wow. So rectangle theory right off the top. Yeah, immediately. And <laughs> artifacts love rectangles. It's yeah. Like artifact decks are more rectangles. There are yes, definitely artifact theme decks are more rectangle theory than non-rect non-artifact for decks. sure non-rectangle decks that'd be weird <laughs> so every time you cast an artifact you get a, a clue that is just good yeah that's already like great. you just play that and there's no card that i can think of that does that already like a three mana two three that does that that's just playable already yeah and this also says activated abilities of artifacts you control cost one less to activate not our activated abilities of clues artifacts so yeah, your bloods are free. Yeah. Oh, does it can uh, reduce to zero? The, it, nothing can be free. Oh, uh, okay. So your your foods are one, mm -hmm. your clues are one. Boy, crime novelist is just loving this, right? Yeah. Because now it's just free. Like... Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Have I got a juicy twist. But this is also just activated abilities of artifacts you control. It's just training grounds for artifacts? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, half of training grounds, but yes. Oh, my Lord. So it goes infinite with basalt monolith. Oh, jeez. Ta-da! We did it. We broke Basalt Monolith. What? Okay, I'm retired. Uh, but yeah. beyond, <laughs> beyond that, I really like it for cards like, uh, I've been really high on Currency Converter. Oh, yeah, you love this card. I love this card. This is a one-mana artifact that says to tap, draw a card, and then discard a card. So now it's one mana to loot. And then when you discard a card, you can exile that card from your graveyard and put it into the converter. And it converts that card into either treasures or two two rogues. Yeah, depending on what it is. Depending on what it is. So so this now is just the one to activate, and then in addition to that, anytime you discard a card, like from your blood tokens, uh, plus you got you a just, clue yeah. when you cast this for exactly. one. Exactly, and then it, you can just turn all of that value into additional oh value. Oh my lord! I also you just like, put this. Go ahead. Like, yeah. Currency converter can also like lock things that you want in your graveyard safely under this artifact for a little bit. Yeah. So now they have to find a removal spell for the artifact, and then you tap the artifact and put the thing in your graveyard. It's very pesky. This card. <laughs> I think this is going to go really well in decks that are just casting a lot of artifacts and don't oh, yeah. care about that second part mm -hmm. as well. But it's also going to go really well in decks where, you know, they have retrofit of foundries mm -hmm. and stuff where they're like, oh, I have a number of artifacts in here that have an activated ability. Right. Because that's the way we always talk about to break cards is by, you know, changing the calculus on how much mana it costs to sort of utilize them, cast them, or mm -hmm. use them. And so... Boy, oh boy. And it works with itself because it just says, hey, if nothing else, reducing the cost of a clue to one mm -hmm. is really good. Yeah. If you look at this uh, and squint a little bit, it says whenever you cast an artifact, pay one, draw a card. <sighs> and it's better than that. Yeah. So this is like Joyra plus. Oh, it goes in the Joyra deck. Like, yeah. yeah, plus you make artifacts with it. Yeah. So now you have artifact ETB triggers, you have artifact sack triggers, you have more draw. More rectangles. More rectangles. Yeah, you can turn them all into creatures. Yeah. You can sack them all to KCI. You can do a lot of stuff. You like, can... we've, we've seen this thing before with, with Zerta, but the fact that this is blue is the game changer. Yeah. Because, you know, red-white artifact decks are sort of few and far between. But the fact that this is blue and it's monocolored and it's three mana, it means it goes in basically an A artifact deck. Pretty sweet. Yeah, it's very good. Okay. 
I had this next one in a uh, draft deck, but we're not going to talk about it quite yet because nope. I just realized that we have to take a quick <laughs> break first and hear a message from our sponsors. But my draft deck, this this card was sweet. It was cool. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Etsy. <laughs> Greetings, acolytes. I, bringer of the last gift, have gathered you in this temple of the dead to honor our demonic lord, Aklazat. <laughs> with a birthday party. With my gift-giving reputation, I always freak out when Aklazat's birthday rolls around. What do you get the god who consumes everything? The trick is being thoughtful. And for that, you can now use gift mode on Etsy. They take the stress out of gifting so you can find the perfect item for anyone. When I need a custom cutting board for the baker in my life, I use Etsy. When I need an art print for the anime lover, I go to Etsy right away. When I need a cool puzzle for the steampunk, I make it myself. Just kidding, <laughs> I get it on Etsy. The Game Nights even sent me this cozy custom throw blanket for the holidays. And you know where they got it? On Etsy, of course. Because the thing is, despite my name, no gift is ever really the last. There's always another birthday, anniversary, or party right around the corner. So whether it's a baby shower or the eternal rebirth of the Blood Lord, gift mode on Etsy always has you covered. Need to find the perfect gift? Don't panic. Try gift mode now. All right, I will untap. I'll draw a card. Hey, have you guys seen Jimmy in like, I don't know, the past two weeks? Uh, I think he left with a big backpack and said he had important company business. Oh, bad news, guys. I went door to door in Burbank and sold almost no command zone merch. Why would you do that? We already sell stuff super easily on Shopify. Oh, yeah. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're working out of your friend's apartment or from a full office suite, Shopify is there to help you grow. I mean, you remember, when we started the podcast, we weren't even thinking about merch. But when fans started asking for it, Shopify made it easy. They handled the selling so we could focus on the content. There's a reason Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. They've got great customer service, useful tools for your business, and the internet's best converting checkout system. So you never have any trouble turning browsers into buyers. Man, that's way better than what I was doing. Wait, did you actually sell anything? No. But I did see Timothy Chalamet at the gas station. Oh. Oh. He didn't see me. Sneaky Timmy. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tcz, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash tcz now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash tcz. All right, we're back. We are talking about the cards you need to know about in the 99 from Murders mm -hmm. at Karlov Manor. It's Karlov, right? Yeah. Yeah. I always want to say Markov. Yeah, it's the alliteration. We'll get you every yeah. time. <laughs> um, all right. So this next one I had in a draft deck that we did here at the office, and uh, it was sweet. This was a different deck than the than the Connect the Dots, by the way. Those are two different decks. And yeah. yeah I had good reaction from <laughs> both. Okay. Uh, illicit Masquerade. Three and a black. Enchantment with Flash. When Illicit Masquerade enters the battlefield, put an imposter counter on each creature you control. Whenever a creature you control with an imposter counter on it dies, exile it. Return up to one other target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. This is pretty cool. It looks more confusing than it is, like yeah. like many uh, reanimation spells. <laughs> The way they have to word these evidently is so crazy. So confusing. Um, but yeah, so this says you're, the board that you have right now, you have so four creatures. When those creatures die, you can get four cards from your graveyard and bring them to the battlefield. Um, and it has flash speed, so you can do this in response to a board wipe. You can do this on end step, and now you untap with a sack outlet. Um, it's going to be sweet in the decks that it's great in. Now, to clarify a little bit here. Yeah. You have to have four creature cards in your scenario. You have yep. to have four creature cards in your graveyard mm -hmm. because remember, the ones that get the imposter counters, the ones you currently have when you cast this, you they, you exile them when you die when they die. Mm -hmm. So let's say you had four creatures, you cast this, somebody board wipes, you can't like get one of the one of those ones with one of the other ones. You mm -hmm. ha you have to get four different new creatures that were already in your graveyard. Yeah. Because the ones on the battlefield are imposters. Right. They are not really. <laughs> yeah. They're actually they are the Jack cards and Hagar. in your graveyard. Uh, I did want to mention, because I always get confused with this stuff, imposter counters are just markers. They're yeah. not something that you can preserve with an ozolith or that you can move around with oh, like the land. It just represents that. The counter itself is not attached to the ability. Got it. 
Um, so the only way to sort of reuse your imposter counters are to make the enchantment re-enter the battlefield by sacking it and bringing it back or by blinking it with like a flicker of fate or something like that. It's interesting because as a reanimation spell, as a, like a board protector, you have to do a decent amount of work. Like, yeah. It, you have to have enough things in your graveyard to get back, mm. and then you're getting different things. It's almost like this is probably more useful in Commander. Like in Limited when I had it, it was great for that, though, because I just mm. trade off early knowing I have this in my deck, and then I want stuff in my graveyard. That's how it gets there. And mm. then later, I you know set up a turn where I have some kind of weird attack, attack with a lot of stuff, play this after blocks, and then it's like, ah, trade a few things, get my best stuff back, and they're like, crap. Yeah. You know, it's like a three or four card advantage and they can't overcome it. Mm. In Commander, it feels more like you're going to cast this proactively with like a sack outlet out. Yeah. And be like, my whole goal here is either have tokens or low impact creatures, but I've self milled and entombed or whatever. And now I'm going to like, I'm going to trade this crappy thing for Kakusho and this crappy thing for Grey Merchant and this crappy thing for whatever. And now mm-hmm. you're all dead. Something like that. Yeah, I I think that that is exactly how this is going to be used because now it turns your sack outlets into instant speed reanimation spells. Oh yeah, you don't even have to. Oh, it's instant speed because you can sack them whenever. Yeah, and that like they can't respond to them most of the time if they're an altar because their mana it's abilities. Feel so good, you're going to be like, cool. I untap, play Ashnod's altar, pass. I can do everything. And then they're like, all right, I go to kill your Ashnod's altar. Yeah. You're like, I flash this in. I sack all these things. I reanimate all this stuff. Yeah, rah, you're rah, dead. Rah. <laughs> They're like, what? <laughs> Crap. <laughs> I thought one thing might happen. That was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this is a sweet card in exactly the right deck, which is a self-mill deck, uh, and it's a deck full of Zach outlets. Yeah. Like, it's going to be a, more of a dedicated reanimator deck. Yeah, it might be good. I was thinking about first, like, Shadowborn Apostles or something like that mm. as well. You got to be careful with the exiling, though, there. Oh, yeah. You can't just do some. No, they yeah, they, oh. if they have imposter counters. They are exiled. Because I was like, ah, you just put out two or three and bring back two or three demons, and the rest mm. can die. Yeah. If you have a sack outlet, though, you could do it. Just go, okay, cool. In response, sack these three. Mm-hmm. Play this. Yeah, yeah. Now Get the dice three left. first. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that works. It's a little bit build your own living death. But two living deaths is cool. <laughs> it's it's different in enough ways that I think it's interesting, right? Because yeah. you can't do what we're talking about with living death. You mm. can't like set up the bring back Kuku show, mm. Grey Merchant in response to whatever at instant speed. I guess you could with Valkanori and stuff a little bit, but like you'd have to bring everything or nothing. Right. It works on for them. Like there's different there's yeah. definitely enough differences here that it's not the same. I think it's sweet. Yeah, that's cool. I'm curious to lose to it. <laughs> uh the next card also likes graveyards. It's Insidious Roots. Black and a green for an enchantment. Creature tokens you control have. Tap, add one mana of any color. Okay, so it's a little bit of a Cryptolithrite-ish. Whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a zero one green plant creature token, then put a plus one plus one counter on each plant you control. So it's sort of half Cryptolithrite, half Desecrated Tomb. Weird. Is that good? If there was two cards I really would think would go together, I wouldn't have picked those yeah. two. Ah, it's interesting because creature tokens you control have tap, add one man of any color. We've had Jahira mm, as which, well. It's just tokens. Which makes is a lot better because it's it makes better, your yeah. treasures just tap for mana. I, I think it's significantly worse than Jahira. Yeah. Because it's only creature tokens, and Jahira is most powerful combined with non-creature tokens. Like, I've tapped rolls with Jahira. It's messed up. Yeah. And then Cryptolith right. Well, you hear it goes in your command zone, so you yeah, completely build around it. Yeah. I mean, she can go in the 99 plenty. True. But, um, but then it only gives creature tokens. Like, we have Cryptolith right that says creatures you control tap for mana, which is just likely more than your creature tokens. Yeah. And then we have stuff like Elven Chorus, which we already mentioned, but it now it says all your creatures tap for mana, and you can cast spells off the top of your library. It's worse than all of those in my head, mm-hmm. like Jahira, Cryptolith right, Elven and Chorus. But then it also has this sort of desecrated tomb plant thing going on. Is that yeah. worth anything? They're so separate. But I guess technically, if you make those plants, you can tap them for mana, right? You kind of make mana yeah. dorks. Mm-hmm. But at a certain point, they become big enough that you want to attack with them if you've done that enough. I mean, yeah. desecrated tomb, we talked about this off camera, but this is a card that like I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make good. Mm. And then decided I couldn't. I didn't yeah, know how. Never figured it out. And I've never seen anybody else do it. So. It's good with Illicit Masquerade. Because <laughs> you can bring it back yeah, one yeah, at a time. Yeah, come out. Also, whenever a creature with an imposter counter dies, exile it. So it dies first, right? And yeah, and then gets exiled. So that's, leaving. So that's a combo. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've already talked about Illicit Masquerade. We're talking about the CD Street stuff. 
Yeah, it's just hard to have enough things leave to yeah. like you put in so much work to do that to get a few one ones that but you just find out like it's not worth that amount of work. It's it it yeah. just doesn't pay off enough. What I really wish is like if Insidious Roots entered the battlefield and exiled a creature from your graveyard. Oh. And now it comes in and it, it gives a you dork. a thing and now it does something. Yeah. At least bottom floor it's a two mana dork. It's a two mana dork, which isn't great. Yeah, but, but that'd be okay. But it's fine. With That's upside. like a thing. Now yeah. now there's like a plan that goes beyond this. Other than, like, than that, I'm going to have a really tough time finding a spot for Insidious Roots. Yeah, because you need a deck that is a token deck that mm-hmm. is exiling things from your own graveyard. Yeah, that's already running Cryptolith, right? Yeah. Like, because if otherwise you'd just run Cryptolith, right? Yeah. And it is already running Jahira, otherwise you'd probably just run Jahira. Or you really want this second ability, which means that it's like a token deck that is, it's a desecrated tomb deck. It's a Tormod the Desecrator deck. Maybe it's... Tormod with no Jahira is only with a background. You can't do Jahira Tormod. No, nope. that would be sweet. But that's what this card is. <laughs> it's Jahira Tormod, I guess. Yeah, I don't know the home for this card. It it feels like it's two abilities that are sort of too disparate, even though yeah. they seem related, to realistically actually like add yeah. up and do the thing yeah. in two colors. On yeah, top of that I, I think it's tough to use. Cool, but cool it's design cool. though. It's one of those cards that's going to become relevant with the right commander or something. Mm-hmm. Like suddenly. In like twenty twenty seven. Yeah. Yeah. If you're making other plants, like if you have, if you have that troll commander, maybe there you're doing plant yeah plant plant, plant, plant stuff. Uh, typo. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next card is not that one. Lost in the maze. Blue, blue, and X for an enchantment has flash. When lost in the maze enters the battlefield, tap X target creatures. Put a stun counter on each of those creatures you don't control, and then tapped creatures you control have hexproof. Oh, that's clever. This is such a slick card. Yeah. Like, min- floor, you can pay blue, blue, flash this in, your tap creatures have hexproof, which is pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. It's not bad. It's like, even if you pay blue, blue, one, tap one of your creatures, it gains hexproof. Now you've countered a removal spell, and you have a permanent that just does something. Yeah, because that is a thing where, you know, as long as you can control when it's tapped, yeah, you... Like that enchantment being something that sticks around is actually has values. Like imagine you're just like a Voltron deck. You're just mm-hmm. you know, so now it's like, oh, if you don't have instant speed removal, you can't touch this thing. Yeah. If just, I'm in combat and attacking you, it has X proof. And if you're a Voltron deck, you definitely want to tap down their creatures sometimes so you can yeah. get in there. So that's it's really good there. It might just save you to, mm-hmm. you know, these kind of cards. Uh, we've got March of Swirling Mist on here as a sort of a comp. Mm-hmm. And that obviously phases things out, but those do save you from attacks that are going to kill you very often or are used yeah. in that way. And this can sort of do that as well. So it's not just protection for your stuff. It can be used offensively. Yeah. Like the ceiling on this is is blue, blue, four. Tap down four things. For two they turns. Are for two turns, get an attack in. It has X proof. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. And that's, you know, it's blue, right? Bounce mm-hmm. it back to my hand. Cast yeah. it again. Not Chain of Vapor, my own thing. Uh, Plus it's an enchantment trigger like this enchantress, this enchantress, this enchantress. Yeah. Uh, My favorite cute use case for this is in uh, vehicle decks. Oh, because you can tap, you can crew it anytime you want. You can crew. Hexproof. Yeah. But now it's a two mana flash enchantment that just says your creatures have hexproof. Your smuggler's copter becomes a swift boost, kind of. Kind of. For all your creatures. That's cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I think this card's neat. I think it's a little slept on right now. So um, if you're a blue flashy player, take a look. Definitely going to die to that card. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have, yeah. Uh, the next one is from the Blame Game Precon. This card is called Mob Verdict. Two red red for a sorcery with secret counsel. Each player secretly votes for another player. Then those votes are revealed. For each vote an opponent received, Mob Verdict deals two damage to that player and each creature that player controls. For each vote you received, draw a card. Worth noting, you have to vote for another player, which doesn't, you know, it means you can't vote for yourself to draw a card. You have to vote for a player to deal damage to them and their board. Um, But this is a fascinating card to me. And they can vote for you, but you won't take the two damage. Yeah, you won't take the damage. You'll draw cards. Got yeah. It. it seems unlikely anybody's going to vote for you to me. Unless you're currently like way ahead and they don't want to wipe their own boards. If they, yeah, if, if they don't want to... I guess they just like, collude and be like, okay, I'll do two to you, you do two to me, you do two to them. But no, because then you get to vote also. Yeah. You so can then you could somebody, do four to, four somebody, to somebody, and nobody's going to want to be that person. Yeah. Then, it's a, I don't know. That's a tough like, spot to be in. 
If they they might go, oh, your board's the worst. We'll yeah. just all vote for you. But then you paid four mana to deal two damage to a player, two damage to their board, and you draw three cards. Well, I'm saying they go. You know, let's say I cast it and yeah. I'm the arch enemy. Yeah. And your board, you don't have much, and mm. you all agree we'll just pick Rachel mm. and. Uh, so, because that does the least damage. Yeah, as a sacrificial. And then I have to pick one of them, and I just go, okay, yeah. Jimmy, since you're already going to take yeah. six. And Rachel then, takes six, and her, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, and that snare is not the best for the person casting it. Yeah, it's, it, the interesting thing about cards like this is secretly, because I think different playgroups are going to treat this differently, Where right, where it's like, if it's each player secretly votes... I, I've seen this kind of uh, ability before on um, on my boyfriend's Kyrdin deck, mm-hmm. and it says secretly vote, and you vo- and you vote, and we were all like, "Well, everybody's going to like talk beforehand, and it's going to be kind of complicated to resi- to resolve." And nobody talks, and that's been in multiple playgroups. So now I'm curious, like when this card goes on the stack, how much are people going to talk about it? Are they going to cover their eyes and just point? And just see what happens. Because that's like that is how Wheel of Misfortune works. That's how Kierden the shipwright has worked in my experience. I don't know. It's it has more consequences than those cards. Yeah, I also think Kierden is pretty complicated. Mm-hmm. So that kinda like when I read Kierden right now. Yeah. Uh, and I'll read it. Let me just read yeah. it for everybody. It says, whenever Kyrdin enters the battlefield or attacks, each player secretly votes for a player, and then those votes are revealed. Each player draws a card for each vote they received. Each player who received no votes may put a permanent card from their hand onto the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Right? So when I see that, I'm like... Uh, uh, I'm just going to pick somebody. <laughs> yeah. It's just... I'm confused about what even is going to happen exactly. <laughs> sure. And so... And and it's it can't really hurt me that bad. Maybe somebody gets more than I get, but it doesn't destroy anything of mine. Mm. So it's just like, I think I'm just going to like randomly choose and see what happens. It's all upside for yeah. the most part. But Mob Verdict is a board wipe and mm. it feels, and maybe I just play with Jimmy too much. Yeah. And Jimmy would never not say anything. Yeah. Like if you're in a, if you're, if you're playing, I don't care what it says, if there's something like this that happens, Jim, there's going to be a discussion at the table because Jimmy is going <laughs> to, he's going to be like, okay, what are we doing? What, what should we do? Here's what mm-hmm. I think we should do. Yeah. And there's going to be a whole thing. And yeah. whether or not everyone tells the truth and ends up following through with what they said is mm-hmm. another conversation, but a conversation will happen. Yeah. And this one is like, hey, we need to wipe this person's board. Or if this happens, we're going to lose. We don't want to wipe that. Like, I don't know. This feels like there will be discussion, but maybe I'm wrong. It does. I mean, there's very real consequences to it. Do you, I, do you think this is written in the spirit of like they, the, the, like, you know, I don't know if this is Gavin or whoever it is. The designer, yeah. Yeah, I always just say Gavin. Sorry to everybody over there. Um, you have so many designers and they do wonderful jobs. Yeah, I know, you know, there's a, there's a million of, you know, Melissa DeToria and mm-hmm. Andrew Brown mm-hmm. and, you know, I'm, I can't name everybody, but. But this one was Gavin. <laughs> there's a lot of them. So I, I really do apologize. It's yeah. kind of a joke when I say Gavin, but whoever designed this, I wonder if in their mind they're like, I really hope it's secret. I genuinely think that the spirit of these cards, the like letter of the of how it was designed, is there's no discussion. So th- and I think that makes this card more fun to cast and resolve because now, now it's up to you to figure out what the right answer is, and you kind of have to be like, all right, well, I think this person's going to pick this, and I think this person, and you have to game it out in your head. Yeah, and that makes casting these and resolving these just a more fun moment in the game than sitting down and being like, well, strictly the right thing to do is this and this and this, which, you know, it, to me isn't exactly how these cards are designed, where it's like, yes, that's probably going to get the best outcome, but as, like, I'm a puzzle kid, I I would rather try and figure out what the vote, right vote is. And I so think... So the it, spirit of it is we should keep it secret, even I though they can't so. really legislate that on the card. They can't legislate that. Yeah. I, like, I'm not saying that you are breaking any rules right. if you were discussing this beforehand. I think it's a style choice, but I think for me, the card is more fun to have cast if nobody talks about it. What if... I think here's what you should do. Before you play this card, if you're mm-hmm. going to play it, you should say, hey, listen, I'm going to play a secret council card. Mm-hmm. And I think it would be the most fun if we don't talk about mm-hmm. what we're voting for. Yeah. And then you put it down. And I think even in that case, even the Jimmy of the world would mm-hmm. have trouble like starting a conversation right. at that. Yeah. Be like, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm not saying it's a 0% yeah. that, that's a, that certain it's... people would. But I think you can at least like, you know, g- you suggest yeah. the outcome that you would like. And then mm-hmm. don't get mad if somebody does talk because it, it sort of is their right. But I think that's probably the best way to kind right. of get that to happen. It's like, I think this is the most fun in my experience when nobody yeah. talks about their vote. So 
I'm going to play it. Here we go. Yeah. And yeah. and now we're in secret council mode. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we're going to all get a dice here. Yeah. And because uh, you know, this isn't one through like, five is this person. And, this isn't like voting cards where it's like you vote, you vote. And then considering those votes, I vote. Right. This is we all decide right now. And let's and see what happens reveal. after that, uh, which I think is is very interesting. Uh, so I think this card's cool. I'm curious to see how it plays in uh, in reality. Uh, we'll find out. Yeah, maybe once or twice. In my experience, people don't play these cards very much because the outcome is so hard to predict that when you're yeah. deck building, you're it's you know you just don't have very many slots for like anything could happen. Yeah, I mean if you're a come from behind kind of deck, I think you could play this. Like if you if you're the aggressor, you don't play this card. Right. But if you're like I have a board wipe, but it's going to require like <laughs> let's see. But it's gonna it's a bit of a weirdo. Oh no, it's the paper too early. Here we go, one more. We're talking about officious interrogation. This is white and a blue for an instant. This spell costs white and a blue more to cast for each target beyond the first. Choose any number of target players. Investigate X times, where X is the total number of creatures those players control. So this is call the copper coats for clue tokens, is what this is, basically. Yeah. It has strive, but not right. keyword strive. Not keyword strive. <laughs> they want to add that keyword to yeah. the set. Okay, so how many clues per two mana makes it worth it? Like if you get yeah. if you get one clue, probably no. not happy. No, two clues, probably not. So we think we need to be at three clues. I think three. If you have one player that has three creatures, then you pay two mana. You get three clues. Two, three clues for two mana. Yeah. That's a pretty good rate? That's a pretty good rate to me. Okay. And then, assuming you're willing to pay four mana, does that mm -hmm. mean you want six? Or is five okay? Depending on the board state. I mean, you're only doing that if yeah. you're free to, you have yeah. that mana, but like, yeah. What's the rate? I'm definitely like not casting six for nine, but I think four for six is a big enough swing that I would do it. Because I, here's where I see this card, mm -hmm. is you cast this on end step before your turn, you have like a fine board, and then you make, let's say you make six clue tokens, and then you slam a Cyber Drive Awakener, and now all of your non-creature -to non tokens are 4-4 four, four flyers. Okay. Like, then your board goes from like, mm, no, you don't have to worry about me, to... Ugh. Yeah, and four mana gets six is not that crazy. Yeah. I, I think two players having three creatures, you see that a lot. I think that's completely Modest. a completely reasonable take on this. Yeah. And, and sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you're like, cool. Two mana make ten. Yeah. Four mana make sixteen. Yeah. I'll make sixteen <laughs> clues for four mana. Yeah, and if I have crime novelist in my hand or something. Or Academy Manufacturer on the over, battlefield. Yeah. Or what was that blue um one that uh, when you sack or pay one less for the activation? Oh yeah, release. yeah, yeah. The 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 Dang it, why'd I throw the paper? I don't know. Scroll the up. Future quick. analyst. Forensic gadgeteer. <laughs> forensic gadgeteer. <laughs> forensic future analyst. I yeah. Forensic gadgeteer, yeah. You, you slam that and then all of a sudden... Yeah. Now it's a lot, a lot of cards. I mean, I, I think this is specifically for the decks that are trying to make a lot of rectangles because this thing makes rectangles. Yep. And if you have a use for those, if you can tap them to make mana, if you have like a... If you have the thing that says tap two artifacts, deal one damage. Your Purifer Grid. Yeah, that one. Yeah, if you have a KCI in your deck, if you have... Oh, my God. Yeah. If you have synergies that say, hey, listen, I can just do things if I have a lot of... What do you call them? Tchotchkes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I call it artifactocrats. You say yeah. tchotchke sure, decks, yeah. but they're the same idea of mm -hmm. like, yeah, I got a lot of little things, and I'm a, I've got a lot of cards in my deck that just say, hey, if you got a lot of little things, we got, we'll give you ways to use them. We'll take care of you. This is actually we'll play a brutal class. This feels like a pretty good way to get a lot of little things because it's instant yeah. speed, so mm -hmm. it's likely to like happen at a moment where you're not sticking your neck out too far. And you can even do things like, oh, you have four creatures. I'll make four. I'll crack one right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of my, uh, that's yeah. the end step before my turn. And that's a perfectly fine turn. Make three clues, draw a card, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's completely oh, reasonable. And Yeah, I know. <laughs> it can't go into Brood Cloud deck, but that's cool because you're often just looking for like, I just need a lot of tokens and then I'll make one cool and make all of them the cool thing. Yeah. 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 That's the kind of deck that I see this going in and it's going to be very good there. All right. Now you can throw it. All right. Uh, the next one is, this is an interesting one too. Okay, on the trail, it's one and a green for an enchantment. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Yeah, this one's from the Deep Clue C Precon. 
Um, it sort of rhymes with burgeoning and exploration, but it's not quite that. It feels quite a bit less good than those other two as far as like, because early on, you're mm-hmm. not drawing your second card, so you're not putting right. lands out. So it doesn't do anything early, which is burgeoning and exploration are really good to like be like, all right, I untap on my first turn and I have, mm-hmm. you know, or my second turn I have four mana. I have four mana, Yeah. yeah. On the Trail feels, uh, it has some of the similar problems to the case that we talked about a little earlier, or a little later, where it's like, it's not really going to ramp you, but it is going to be a big piece of an engine, Mm. I think. If you're you're making use of landfall triggers, if you're drawing a lot of cards, just generally, if you're playing an Enchantress deck, like we talked about earlier, On the Trail is going to be put in more work there, but this isn't going to be something that you play onto and then you ramp with it. It doesn't do anything on two. It just doesn't do anything there. So, yeah, yeah this is... And a- even on three, what are you playing that's drawing you an extra card to get that extra land drop? So, it really is yeah. like a later turn play. Yeah, like yeah. we said, Tatiova, EC feel like the right home for it. Right. And you probably cast this after you've got them out. You go, Tatiova, hit my land drop, draw my card. Mm-hmm. Next turn, cast on the trail, hit my land drop, draw my card, hit my next land drop, draw my card. Mm-hmm. Because the on the trail gave me that second land drop. But until then, it wasn't worth deploying. Right. And and that's like, the land isn't exactly ramp. It is, obviously, but you're getting additional value from having the land hit the battlefield. Because otherwise, this is just going to be like, I sort of incidentally have more mana when my engine is already online. Yeah. Which is good, but it's not necessarily a card I'm going to dedicate a slot to. The other thing I would say is this probably becomes better if you've got either a commander or, you know, engines in your deck that are going to allow you to draw cards on other players' turns. Yeah, for sure. Because now all of a sudden... Because you can only draw your second card per turn once on your turn. Mm -hmm. So that's only one extra land drop. If you've got a Consecrated Sphinx, sweet. Oh, my Lord. Consecrated Sphinx with this seems ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. It's just like, okay, it's burgeoning then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... I guess burgeoning just is kind of good. But uh, like, how much better is this than just a Consecrated Sphinx if you have this and a Consecrated Sphinx? Yeah. A decent amount better, decent though, amount. because the thing that will hold you back usually if you have a Consecrated Sphinx is the amount of mana you have access right. to. Yeah. So, yeah. But we've all had a burgeoning out and dropped all our lands and really not done much because mm. we're like, sweet, I have all my lands out. I don't have any lands. So then I just miss my land drop for two turns. And at that point, my opponents have the same amount of lands in play that I do. So if you don't combine it with card draw, this requires card draw because it wants your second card per turn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do just think it's just going to end up not being very good in most decks, but in Mm -hmm. the decks it's good and it will be good. It will be quite good. Yeah. Yeah, If you're going to put it in your deck, you just need to make sure it's better than an explore, which draws you a card and gives you an extra land drop. Yeah, Uh, honestly, like explore is going to be better in a lot of decks. In a lot of decks. Where it's just like, I drew a card, I put an extra land in play, it was basically a rampant growth that drew me a card. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. Yeah. And this is I guess it's be, not a ramp. Rank growth does draw your card. It just puts it into play. Yeah. It's the same. This is an explorer that requires you to draw an extra card. Then you get the land tapped. Yeah, it's an explorer that sometimes goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know that you want that. Yeah, uh, it's it's trickier to use than it looks. Uh, speaking of tricky to use. Oh, my. Yes, it's <laughs> Prisoner's Dilemma. <laughs> this is three red red for a sorcery. Each opponent secretly chooses silence or snitch. Then the choices are revealed. If each opponent chose silence, Prisoner's Dilemma deals four damage to each of them. If each opponent chose snitch, Prisoner's Dilemma deals eight damage to each of them. Otherwise, Prisoner's Dilemma deals 12 damage to each opponent who chose silence. It also has flashback for seven. <laughs> As if resolving this once wasn't fun enough, you can do it two times. So if everybody's silent and doesn't snitch on their co-conspirators, mm-hmm. they take the minimum amount of damage. Yes. If everybody snitches, everybody's duplicitous, mm-hmm. then they all take eight damage. Right. But if anybody is silent, doesn't rat anybody else out, but gets ratted out on, the person who was, you know, the one that kept their mouth closed is the one that takes the 12 damage. Yeah, just gets wailed. <laughs> yeah. So when they say stitches get stitches, that's not actually this. This is, yes. Yeah. yeah. Unless everybody snitches. Well, if everybody snitches, yeah, that's yeah. the medium, mm-hmm. you know, but you've kind of snitched and got snitched on, so yeah. you, you kind of protected yourself a little, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it just depends. You got to ask yourself a question like, do you know, are you a dirty rat or not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> are you going to rat people? I'm out? an are aggro deck. Snitch? I pick snitch every are time. You snitch? <laughs> You know, so, if you're with Rachel, just <laughs> never pick silence. <laughs> but if everybody I, picks silence, it doesn't do much. But the, if, the yeah. problem is, like, how do you... 
Yeah. It's how much you trust your like a your fellow opponents. The funny thing about this card is it yeah. doesn't secretly. It doesn't say the word secretly. It on does. It. Where it does. It Each says opponent, it oh, secretly. It's actually, but it doesn't say. Oh, it doesn't say secret council at the start. No, because it's only the uh, opponents who choose. Oh, got it. The got person it. who cast it doesn't get to vote because they're they the jailkeeper or whatever. Yeah, they're the warden. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, uh, so this is also in the blame game precon. Some real cool cards coming out of that deck. Um, I, I wanted to walk through a couple of scenarios because it is really goofy. So, like, uh, let's just say all life totals are like thirty. What do you vote for in that situation? Like, let's say I cast it. <laughs> so I think my strategy will be to do silence and try and mm. establish to. It, I think it's different. Mm. Like, if we're playing with our play group. Yeah, yeah. I'll do silence because if it goes wrong. I might be able to establish a reputation that, oh, Josh will do silence, which will make it safe for them to do silence later. So I'll take my lumps the first few times it gets cast. to Play the long game. Yeah, exactly. Just for like, you know, for the next few years after that, they know Josh will pick silence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's one way to go. I'd just be willing to die at first to do it. I was going to say, what if your life total is 12? Yeah, no, that's what it sucks. Now do you pick silence? Uh, (laughs) It's hard to imagine anybody picking silence if their life total is at 12 or below. Yeah, I feel like you have to snitch. Because one per- but that's what the pl- prisoner's dilemma is. Exactly. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> Boy. I <it's-> love it. <laughs> I had so the much fun with The worst is the flashback guy. because you're Even like. The, you, yeah, you resolve it and you're like, ugh. Well, it's great if everybody's at 30 and you resolve it yeah. and one person snitches or something. Because then when you flash it back, the other people definitely want to get back the snitch. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so it's just going to go downhill. The only way that goes wrong is if they somehow all do silence the first time. Right. Because then they'll trust each other to do it a second time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if you can, like, fork it or something. It, the the more you can cast this card, the, <laughs> the, the crazier the results get, right? Yeah. It's... I, 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 I think this card is is incredibly <laughs> How fun. How did it take so long for this card to get designed? I can't. It's it feels like it's so perfect. It's such a gimme, right? Yeah. And I love that it has flashback. Um, <laughs> the question is for this card is not do you play it because obviously you play it. It's a ton of fun. Uh, the question is where. Uh, what kind of deck wants this kind of card? I mean, it's sort of an aggroy, Bernie deck, right? Something that has mm. wound reflection, havoc festivals, right? You know, an Obosh style deck. Mm. Obosh would double all this damage. Oh also, God, that changes all the voting. Yeah. Now you're like, I can't say silent because if I say silent, I could take twenty four. <gasps> you have to snitch, but it's still sixteen. <gasps> well, then maybe we really want to go silence because we could get eight. That's nothing. But then I don't trust Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> snitch. <laughs> Yeah, that feels like the type of deck I would want in. Yeah. Aggro decks, like you said, though. Definitely. Yeah, because the the closer they get to dead, the more, the harder it is to hold that line of like right. silence. I'll be silent. I won't snitch. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. It's decks that can put pressure on life totals and anything that doubles the damage. If you're playing a Sulfim, Mayhem, Dominus, you're playing a Dragon's Approach deck, I could see this earning a slot because uh, you're just pressuring, pressuring, pressuring that life total and putting pressure on your poor prisoners uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. All right, the next card is Reenact the Crime. It's one blue, 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 so one and three blue mana. Mm-hmm. For an instant, exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. Copy it. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So it can, okay. be, put, it can be put there from anywhere. So yeah. if you entomb it or mill it. Oh, entomb it. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah. entomb into this gets you any non-land card. Yeah, you can uh, entomb anything. Ca- and it's a cast. Copy and cast it. Yeah, that's like five mana instant speed omniscience. Yeah, you could even probably snag an Eldrazi because this is instant speed, so in response to the trigger, you can yes. still do it. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's yeah. two cards, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's five mana, but you could like, you could bin it, like you could Faithless Looting yep. and then cast this. Yep. Um, or you could mill it if you're doing a lot of mass mill and you're doing like an instance and sorcery deck. Surveil it. Yeah, surveil it is, is sort of the idea, I think. Yeah. If you're milling your opponents, you could get something out of your opponents. Oh, it's in a graveyard. A graveyard. You're right, you're right. So it's one it, of those... Somebody could remove it and you could do and it. And then you could steal or it. Or you could yeah. remove it and do it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's To me, this card is really interesting because it feels kind of flexible. And then in game, it's going to feel a little bit more narrow than that. Um, but if it does resolve, it's going to be... It's going to be a big spell. Like, it's going to be a big momentum swing. It sort of reminds me of, like, a thrilling encore, which is, like, if it happens, this card's going to be amazing. 
I mean, thrilling on car gets everything though. Yeah, all the creatures, I guess. Yeah, but this couldn't get anything, and it's a lot. It's a little less narrow than thrilling on car. Yeah. This card will probably be more powerful and casual than in more optimized because you'll have sort of bigger, scarier stuff that's mm-hmm. likely to go to the bin. Whereas a lot of like small, little optimized pieces, you don't care as much about getting them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's and the one blue, blue, blue is not that easy to no, hold that's up. Tough. It's another. I keep saying it, but it's another one where like if you don't have any instances, very many instances in your deck, this card's not going to be good. You just mm-hmm. can't afford to hold it up. If you have a lot, then it becomes decent because you're just ready for this scenario, even though it's not that going to come out that often, and you can sort of wait for it, I guess, of you know something gets milled or uh, mm-hmm. destroyed. I don't know. Do you try and se- are you playing this in a deck where you're trying to set it up? Like, what deck exactly wants this? I for me, I I think I would put this in in like a milli deck, like a self mill or a um you know g- general mills deck, a serial deck. Um, <laughs> but if you're milling yourself, it has to be pretty low cost for you to still have four mana left after something gets yeah. milled. I mean, if you're milling yourself, that's usually permanent based, right? Like I'm not usually paying mana to mill myself on my turn. Yeah, you're casting something. Sometimes it does yeah, it though. Sometimes it's your supplier or something that doesn't cost a lot of mana, but it's still like oh, I have to have four mana left over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where I imagine it because you have the most choices and you're in control of that happening. Mm-hmm. I don't see like spending a removal spell and then casting this thing to be like a good play. That's a weird two for one kind of situation. I guess you're up one, they're down one. So maybe it's a two for two. But uh, no, it's a, yeah, it's just one for ones because you, you use a card to get rid of their card, then you use a card to get a card. To right? get their yeah. card. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a one for one. I mean, you could capitalize on somebody else removing a card. Yeah. Uh, the problem with that is like a lot of our removal is exile, XL right? Or it's, bounce, it, yeah. yeah, it's people still do play some amount of destroy though. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard just, to count on. It's just not as flexible as that in that way. Or maybe you're more likely to get an enchantment or something, which yeah. is less exileable. For sure, that's that's usually destroyed. Yeah. Something that we were talking about is that this might be good in decks that want sick tokens. Uh, oh, if you're yeah, taking yeah. like like a Brutaclad deck, for example, where you're like, I want a cool token and want to turn all my tokens into that. This gives you a very cool token. Yeah, like or that. the ability to get a cool token right. matters. Yeah, mm-hmm. or you have a Tristani, all those, not, obviously this is in blue, but something that's going to populate. Yeah, so Xavier like, Saul was the one I thought of. Yeah, okay. Yep. So you're going to populate. So populating one ones isn't what you want to be doing. Mm-hmm. You're like, no, I'm going to populate this copy of you know, some awesome creature that I made right. because, it, you know, somebody else milled it or it died. Yeah. Or I milled it or it died. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it, it's I think, funky. Uh, I, it's more powerful than I gave it credit for, but it definitely, it would be hard to assemble this, I think. To me, it feels like a card we're not going to see that often. It's too, it's going to be too narrow, hard to pull off. It'll be stuck in your hand, so people will start, you know, people will try it, and then my guess is a lot of games, they'll... You know, evaluate after the game. Be mm-hmm. like, I had, tr- I just couldn't find a spot to it's use this. It's in my hand the whole time, and I'm yeah. gonna cut this. Yeah, but it's cool. But you could do the cool thing. <laughs> We've got a couple more cards to go over, including cards from the exclusive Ravnica Clue Edition set, uh, where the, those cards are only in that box. And we're going to go through the green iteration of a deck can have any number of these cards. Uh, card, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, the green rat, uh, Shadowborn. A dragon's, dragon's approach. approach uh, what's the There's another persistent, one. persistent petitioners? petitioners. Yeah. yeah. Green finally gets one. They're in the game. And we'll talk about it after a few words from our sponsors. Hi, I'm Zealous Conscripts, and this is the love of my life, my Valentine. Yeah, it's me, Kiki Kiki. <laughs> On our own, we're both good cards, but together our potential is unlimited. It's combo time! That's, That's the, the power, power of a good, good pairing. And you know what I've been pairing lately? My Raycon wireless earbuds with my favorite audiobook, Infinite Jess. <laughs> so much jest! We both use our Raycons every day. The audio quality is incredible, and they're just half the price of other premium brands. The eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life are perfect for indeterminately long walks with our cat, 
Felidar Guardian. Good kitty, good kitty! And Kiki loves the optimized gel tips and perfect in your fit, because they never fall out no matter how fast you combos off. Of course, our favorite feature is the noise isolation mode, so we can enjoy a quiet night by the fire. Just him, me, and 12,000 additional copies of me. Watchy, watchy. Go to buyraycon.com slash command today to get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's buyraycon.com slash command to score 15% off and free shipping. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. You browsing for some new tech? Yeah, I'm building Team Out and Architect. Ooh, how about Zergo and Ojitai? Did you just drag and drop that card image directly into your deck? Yep, with Architect, you can drag and drop card images from EDH Rec or Scryfall directly into the deck list. No typing required. That is so cool. Ooh, okay, check this out. I'm gonna drag and drop Dragon Storm into the deck, and then boom, I'm gonna drop a bunch of dragons on the battlefield. A nine drop, huh? Seems ambitious. It was just for the pun. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. Welcome back, everybody. We are talking about cards in the 99 from Murders at Karlov Manor, and we are going to talk about the slime against humanity. <laughs> it's a good name. <laughs> All right, this is the green Relentless Rats or whatever. Yeah. Slime Against Humanity. Two and a green for a sorcery. Create a 0-0 zero, zero green ooze creature token with trample. Put X-1-1 one, one counters on it where X is two plus the total number of cards you own in exile or in your graveyard, or sorry, and in your graveyard that are oozes or are named Slime Against the Humanity. A deck can have any number of cards named Slime, slime Against Humanity. Okay. So if you cast this and you have three of them in your graveyard, mm -hmm. you will get a 5-5. Five, five. Is it 2 plus two 1 plus additional? 2 plus the total number of cards you own yeah. in exile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get a 3-mana 5-5. Five, five. And it also counts other oozes. Mm -hmm. So you can have some amount of ooze going on. You can have a scavenger ooze yeah. and the other ones in there. The big thing here is that the, the tokens do naturally have trample yep. is nice. They're 1-1 um, one, one themed, which... Green likes. It's weird a little bit that it's on a sorcery. I agree. I wouldn't have guessed that green got it on a sorcery, but I do love that it's ooze themed. I think that's very appropriate for green. And it's finally like the ooze thing that uh, people are after. But I, I agree. It's sort of bizarre that it's on a sorcery. Because green cares about, you know, permanence generally and creatures mm. and can get permanence out of its graveyard, can't get sorceries generally. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can like... Um, you can like delve these away and stuff. Put, mm -hmm. If they're in exile, they'll still count towards your total, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, they, this got gamed uh, pretty quick, but there's also ways to just exile a whole bunch of them from your deck. You can uh, surgical extraction yep. it. So if once you've got one in your graveyard, you can exile it from your graveyard and then search your library and exile, I don't know, 10 of them or something yeah, like that. Any number, so... And now any ooze, you like any slime against humanity you cast is going to be a 12-12 at least, which is now we're talking three mana 12-12s, pretty good. Uh, Test of Talents will do this as well, but that's five mana and you have to counter your own spell. But uh, it, it, goes a crazy. it goes a little bit better into some of these color pairings. Um, you can like Thrumming Stone, obviously. Mm -hmm. A lot of the cards that work with a lot of these other cards yeah, will I still work. I wanted to mention these because, like, it, it, you and I both have a Dragon's Approach deck, yep. and cost redu reduction is a big part of casting the sorcery repeatedly. Yes. So I think that's going to be a big part of this deck as well. Locket of Yesterday's is, yeah, is really a good. big, big tech in decks like this. It's so good once you get that. Oh, my God. might be God. that. It's one of the best cards in the Dragon's Approach deck. For, for sure. sure. Yeah. Another thing I just realized is, you know, green's really good at playing creatures off the top of the library. You can't mm -hmm. do that with the sorcery either. Nope. I just want to go back to that. Yeah. yeah. That's a little annoying. Uh, yeah, I think... I don't know. When you see the, when I saw Dragon's Approach, I was like, mm. "Sweet, I want to do that," but I yeah. don't feel the same about Slime Against Humanity. I don't know why. It's funnier. It's not. It's not a, exactly a stormy thing, which is like if I have twenty five of the same sorceries, I expect that I'm going to win if I cast uh, ten of them. Right? Interesting. Yeah. Like if I cast ten of these things, you're like, "I did it!" And, but now you just sort of have a board, and if it gets board wiped, then you are blown out. Yeah, and honestly, there's not a great plan. And it doesn't even count the other ones on the battlefield. It no. really wants you to have them in the graveyard in exile well, yeah, and make a couple of big ones. Graveyard, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. the sorcerers. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah right. You're right. Because right, right, not a creature. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It's, I, the funny thing about it is I think it goes with, it, at the end of the day, it's a plus one, plus one counter deck. Yeah. Which isn't all that interesting to me. And I really like this kind of thing. 
Um, but there are some like cool proliferate things you can do with it. Like Flux Channeler is really, really good. Because yeah. now every time you cast one, you proliferate all your other oozes. Evolution um, Sage would also work. For sure. Yep. Uh, Radstorm is a card that's already uh, announced for um, the Fallout. Fallout. And it's incredible. <laughs> it is, is a four mana instant that says Storm Proliferate. Man, throwing stone into this. Whoa. <laughs> now, it, now it's like, brrr, like all your oozes are huge. They're still slow, but you know, they're here. And You're huge. playing Concordant Crossroads in this deck, I hope. Yeah, yeah, haste is a really big deal. Yeah. Um, so the next question is like, who do you put in the command zone yeah, for this? Yeah, what's kind of the strategy? commander for this? Yeah. Um, the most popular ones on EDH Rec right now are Umori the Collector, yeah. which will reduce the casting cost of your sorcery, is also an ooze, which is cool. E Progenitor Ooze, which is already Ooze Storm. My favorite is Falco Spara, Pact Weaver. It's a Bant Commander that says, uh, when it, it enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it, you may look at the top card of your library any time. You may cast spells from off the top of your library by removing a counter from a creature you control in addition to paying their other costs. Oh, nice. So you get one out. It's a whatever mm -hmm. it is, even if it's just a 2-2, two -two, and you remove yeah. a counter from it to cast another one off the top of your library. And exactly. You, and that makes a 3-3, three, three, and then you... Mm. Nice. And now, you, if you answer all of the cost reduction problems, now you have the card acceleration, which is the other half of this of the puzzle. To me, I thought of Samut Voice of Descent immediately yeah. because um, the thing I want is haste. Because you, if I jump through enough hoops to get you know seven or eight of these out, mm -hmm. and they're all huge, you have to swing with them. Then you're never going to keep them. Yeah. So to me, that's what I want the most out of it, all of it is just haste. And you put Maelstrom Wanderer down, which might even be better than Samut because it'll find you a couple of them hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you really. You need Concordant Crossroads, you need Anger, or something that says, I'm going to get to attack, because you were going to jump through a lot of hoops to get to the point where it's like, yeah, I have six oozes, and they're all nine nines. And they have Trample, yeah. and they're uh, uh, next turn. Yeah. Look out. Yeah, you're not going to have them next turn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Either you won't be there, or they won't be there. You could do one of the things that's like, lets you cast Sorceries at flash speed, but that means you're definitely in blue. Yeah. So, you do have to plan around some of these problems. It's a little overcosted. you have to keep the card draw up, and once they're here, they can't attack yet. But, pretty sweet! Uh, oh, this is the next, the new white card draw spell that everybody's raving about. Okay, here it is. Trouble in pairs. Two white white for an enchantment. If an opponent would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. Okay. The more interesting part is the next part. Whenever an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures, draws their second card each turn, or casts their second spell each turn, draw a card. <laughs> That's a lot. So That's this... really cool. This is like Mangara plus the Council of Four, kind of, or yeah. Smuggler's Share. We've been fooled by this type of card before. Yes. Smuggler's Share is the card that, like, I think a lot of us thought was going to be pretty good and mm -hmm. ended up being kind of unplayable. I do believe this is different, but what do you think about it makes it different than Smuggler's Share? I it's the second spell clause. Yeah. Casting two spells in commander is sort of par for the course these days. We we've shied away from casting big seven mana spells and we're closer to casting two four mana spells. Yep. And that's how you win games is you get to the double spelling portion of the game. So I, I think that is gonna be where you draw the cards the most. And I say that from having a Mangara deck. And then you'll incidentally get some from the other one. From the other one, you need as one well. that's kind of solid and reliable. And I think that's gonna be the solid one. Like Mangara has reliably drawn me two cards easily, a rotation, yeah. uh, off of that alone. And if you pay four mana and you draw two cards and you untap, the, it doesn't feel great, but you've drawn two more cards in white. So the Smuggler's Share only gets you a card if an opponent has drawn two cards that turn. Yeah. Which isn't always guaranteed, especially if you play against people that aren't great deck builders. <laughs> well, well, it just was unreliable, and it was unreliable to the point where like sometimes you got zero. You got zero. Yeah. Yeah. And you really need to get more than one is what you really wanted. So. I was in one game where Smuggler's Share was good, and it was good two re full rotations after they cast it. <laughs> and you were like, it's come, like it's doing work now. But it took a long time for it to get sort of live. And I think Trouble in Pairs is going to draw you cards immediately. The big question for me about Trouble in Pairs is not, is it going to draw you cards? It's going to draw you cards. It's, is it too expensive? Is it worth four mana? Is it worth four mana on an enchantment? That's the thing that I immediately thought, which is, you know, we just are sort of are where we are. Again, people mm. get mad when we talk about it this way. But, like, four mana, it doesn't do anything, right? Four mana, go. 
And if you wait to cast it later, it's not worth it because it has to be around long enough to sort of pay off for you. Mm-hmm. So you kind of got to cast it as early as possible to get the most card draw over the course of the game as possible. So it is four mana. Yeah. Uh, cross fingers. How many cards do you have to get with it over the course of first the first round and then the next couple of turns to, for it to feel good? I, I think you definitely want two the turn you cast it. Uh-huh. Otherwise, it feels actively bad. If you only draw one card off of this, you're, it's been a disaster. Right. And I think you want five, at least in and after the second rotation. And even that feels a little bit slow. My worry, too, is your opponents do have a decent ability at that point in the game to alter their play without hurting themselves too much. Mm-hmm. I mean, not casting two spells a turn is tough for them, but... No, that's what I mean. They do have an ability because you can often be like, ah, I'd rather cast this two and this three drop. I'll cast a four drop. Yeah. It, I still advance my board position. I don't give them a card. And mm-hmm. you can justify those decisions and they don't feel too bad. Yeah. It's in some ways sometimes easier than paying for risk study, which people seem unable to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that that would be my worry with this card a little bit. I know I've, you know, I've had my in play and I've seen you play it mm-hmm. and you do draw cards in it. And what tends to happen is somebody else does two things and then somebody else is like, well, to keep up with them, I've got to do two things mm. and it can spiral. But, yeah. that w- you know, Mangar is also a 2-4 with lifelink that has other things going exactly. on. Exactly. It's board presence. Yeah. And Trouble in Pairs is not. So it doesn't stop a Timna from coming at you or mm. a Ragaman or something and, you know, you need to get more cards out of it, therefore, to sort of make it worth it. So that would be my worry. And I, my feeling is, just my gut feeling is, it's probably one mana too expensive. Yeah. At three mana, it would feel broken, but at four mana, it feels... It feels chunky. Um, I I want to try it, but I, I'm sort of not sure where it goes. Like, I don't think Mangara needs it. It's got Mangara in the command zone. Right. Why would I cast this on four? Right. Um, so I, I'm not sure where exactly this card goes in, in my suite of white decks. But I think a lot of people look at it and see Smothering Tithe, and Smothering Tithe is, <laughs> no, is, no, is, no. is you tap out for a moment... <laughs> And then you're not tapped out and you yeah. and you progress your board. This is you tap out and you hope you get value from it. And then you untap and hopefully spend that value. And Smothering Tide, they can't dodge it. Like, yeah. they just can't. If they pay the two mana so that you mm-hmm. don't get the one mana, you won. Right, yeah. Right? You still won. But here, if they pay, play their four drop instead of their two two drops, you did not win. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, I... I, it's definitely going to come down and it's definitely going to draw a lot of cards. And if you have a slower, grindier white deck, that's where it goes. Yeah. This doesn't go in your, like, beat down angels for a stack i don't think uh more cool white cards unexplained absence this one has cool art three and a white for an instant for each player exile up to one target non-land permanent that player controls for each opponent excuse me for each permanent exiled this way its controller cloaks the top card of their library i like it yeah this is great this is exiles four well three maybe yours but three the worst things yep other than lands i guess yep and then they get a random two two off the top and maybe get value out of that but first you get three awesome things off the board it's instant speed it's non-land permanent it's only got one white pip it is each you know it's grasp of fate but better and they don't come back. Yeah, th- there's the downside that we're not yeah. talking about yet, which is that they do, uh, I'm going to say manifest, but what's it called? Cloak. Cloak. They cloak them. The top card of their library. So you can sort of give them access to something that, you know, they can flip up and it's mm. kind of bad. But often what we've learned is that that manifest is not that bad because it's, it's you you know, something like at least 40% of their deck or so is lands, it's which land. you don't care. And yeah. then there's some amount of spells and stuff. And then there's a whole bunch of ETB stuff, which they don't get. So right. there's really a small number of creatures when you actually break it down that you're super scared that they get. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that downside is actually not that bad. Yeah. I like, I play Grasp of Fate quite a bit. I love that card. And this feels like it's probably a little bit better. Because I think it is. They Instant can't kill the Grasp of Fate and yeah. just get the thing it's back, right? The, yeah. This doesn't say, hey, this is a thing that when it leaves, it's just like, no, you might get another thing. Mm. But for me, if you were still playing Generous Gift, this replaces it. Oh, yeah. It's only one more mana. It's one more mana. You get two more things and they are exiled. And they even get a 2-2 instead of a 3-3. It has ward, though. Yeah. So you can't touch it. (laughs) That ward is annoying in (laughs) in limited, I've noticed. It's very annoying. (laughs) I think this card's sick. I like, uh, I will be trying it out in a number of decks. It's a little expensive, but it just answers a lot. Yeah, I like this type of card a lot. It is efficient when you look at it on the right axis, mm. which is that, you know, per target, 
it's like less than two mana. Yeah. So, and you know, your ability to get your own thing could be useful because you can just be like, okay, I'm going to turn this treasure or this food into a two, two. And if I know the top card of my library, that Mm -hmm. might be amazing. Yeah. You could, and it just gives you a chump blocker. It just gives you a body to wear and equipment. It yeah. gives you, like... They attack you and you go, okay, exile that, 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 my own thing, make a 2-2, two, two, block, block your thing. Yeah. It could also be, like, if I got a top out, exile my thing, block your thing, flip it up, eat it. Yeah. Like, that. that's possible. And that's a disaster. <laughs> um... Yeah, this card's sweet. I I think it's really going to get people. Yeah, I like it. Cool. We're going to move on to a little red hate bear. It's Vengeful Tracker. Okay. Vengeful Tracker is one and a red for a 2-2. Creature, human detective. Whenever an opponent sacrifices an artifact, Vengeful Tracker deals two damage to them. Oh, Vengeful Tracker. Fighting the good fight. Just trying to hold the fort down all by itself. Yeah. The problem with this is like, yes, this is great against treasures. It, they have to answer this before they crack too many treasures. Right. Where do you play this? Yeah, because if you play it early, then they just know they don't make a lot of treasures. They kill it first, whatever. It needed flash. Yeah. It, but even then, if it had flash, they'd be gone. like a crack it didn't do anything. response. Yeah. yeah. It's Vengeful Tracker. It, it needed it, split second. It reminds me of Viridian Rebel, where you're like, yes, if you're playing against an artifact deck, Viridian Rebel says whenever an artifact is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield, you may draw a card. Very powerful, especially if they're playing clues, treasures, f- food, whatever. But there's not a lot of decks that synergize with your opponents having artifacts. Right. There are. There's like Vazi, Keen, Negotiator, and Kibo, Uktabi Prince, who's a house, by the way. That card's busted. Um... <laughs> Have you seen Kibler's deck? I don't, deck? I don't really think I've played against that deck yet. It's yeah. really powerful. Um, it's Kibler. It's, it's more Kibler probably than the deck. He's like, there's just fun monkeys <laughs> yeah, in it. Yeah, sure. Like, yeah, and you're turning everything to artifacts <laughs> and blowing them up. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just trouble. It, it's hard to build around this card. So it's hard to find a slot where you're like, this card's going to be really powerful in my deck. It might be very good against treasures. And if you're very treasure heavy meta you're very clue heavy meta then maybe you consider it but it's hard to find spots for hate bears in casual decks yeah in my experience hate bears kind of only work when there's a lot of hate bears yeah so if you have a deck that has a number of hate bears this could be another hate bear that's in there and it's really just like i'm just throwing up a bunch of roadblocks Mm -hmm. and this will be one of them it's a speed bump yeah but as like a one-off card in a deck that doesn't have other hate bears it seems unlikely to do much yeah I wish it did, though. It's cool. All right. The next one is another one that I had in a limited deck. <laughs> did you really? Yeah, this I splashed for it. This card's insane in I, limited. Yeah, it was really good. I splashed for it. <laughs> it's War Leader's Call. One a red and white for an enchantment. It says creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it deals one damage to each opponent. It's well, Impact Hammers and Glory of Anthem stapled together, and then they just discounted it two mana. I don't know why. Yeah, it's three mana <laughs> for five mana worth of permanence, and we'll play both of those permanents. Uh, this card's great. If you're in Boros and you have play Impact Tremors, play War Leader's Call. It's really good, yeah. And that's It's that. just super efficient. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just great. Yeah, you like, can't really say anything bad about it because you're happy with all of the modes and mm-hmm. the price tag on all of the modes you're, is like a discount. Yeah. 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 So uh, we'll see a lot of that definitely added to your Impact Tremors, your white-red token decks. Uh, the rest of the cards that we're going to be talking about today come from the Ravnica Clue Edition. That is the only place to pick them up. I don't even think you can get them in collector boosters, or you can, of course, get them at singles at cardkingdom.com slash command. If you haven't seen this, this product comes with 21 evidence cards. These are like the guaranteed cards that are in here. They're the five color commanders. They're a bunch of lands, and then there's like the knife wrench. All the clue the, weapon. Yeah, all the clue cards. So those are your evidence cards. And then you open eight Clue Edition booster packs and you sort of shuffle them together and then you play weird multiplayer against each other and as you play the game every time you hit people you like crack clues and you solve the case so it's somewhere between multiplayer magic and clue the board yeah i don't i don't know exactly how it works but at some point like once per game you're allowed to take a guess at like it was so and so in the study with the knife or whatever yeah and if you're right then you win on the spot but if you're wrong you keep playing magic like normal but you don't get to guess anymore yeah I've been thinking about it as like a gift bundle that has unique cards in it, Uh I think is a really good way to think about Mm. it. There's a bunch of guaranteed cards, and then there's these booster packs, which do have some sweet cards in it. We're going to talk about two of the coolest ones in the 99. All right. The first one is Corporeal Projection. 
Yeah. It's a blue and a red for a sorcery. Target creature you control games, gains myriad until <laughs> end of turn. That means whenever it attacks for each opponent other than defending player, you may create a token that's a copy of that creature that's tapped in attacking that player or a planeswalker they control. Exile the tokens at the end of combat. And then it has overload for three blue, blue, red, red, so all your creatures get myriad. <laughs> so again, Myriad is like, if I attack Rachel with a Mole Drifter and it has Myriad, I'll make a copy Mole Drifter attacking Jimmy and attacking Jake. Yeah. So you'll make to have two ETBs draw four cards off of it. Yeah, hit him each for two. Yeah. This card's actually very sweet. It's I like really it a lot. It's really cool. Yeah. I, so this is like going to be really good with ETB creatures like you mentioned. So I, I think this is... You look at it sort of like a blink spell mm. or like a saw in half kind of. Yeah, or yeah. kill a thing, get two ETBs. Yeah, um, if I have a good ETB, I target this with it and I'll get two more of those ETBs. Yeah, and it's hard. Like at that rate, it's hard to imagine this card being bad. If you have a Solemn on the board and you play Solemn, you get two ETBs on Solemn. And then if they die in combat, which they probably shouldn't, they should just take the two. But still. You draw additional cards. Yeah. Um, that seems great, and that's a very modest scenario. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and that's you didn't even well, overload it in that case. The way I thought about this was the card Blade of Selves. Yeah. Which we were talking about it, but in my entire commander career, mm -hmm. I've probably seen Blade of Selves create a Myriad token less than five times. Yeah, for sure. Because it costs so much. It's like... Two mana to cast, four, four to, to equip, equip. So it's six mana to and get And then off. attack. Yeah. And they always kill the thing. Yeah. Because it's six mana. Yeah. Uh, so even getting one myriad trigger off blade of cells was like a win, right? And this is like cool. How about if that was a two mana sorcery? That'll be a lot easier, right? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, it will yeah, be it way will easier. Be. I, I don't have to cast it first. <laughs> yeah, it'll be way easier. I don't have to equip and hope it doesn't die. <laughs> yeah, this is great. It's so fun, and there's some like really wild stuff that you can do with it. Uh, my favorite is like. Uh, I think Damon mentioned that if you play Spellseeker, you can go find this. Then you can target Spellseeker with it. Attack with Spellseeker. Yeah. Go find two more things. Your Cyclonic Rift and like a counter spell. That's sweet. Yeah. That's like a turns your Spellseeker into three. But then you can do way busted red damage combat stuff. Oh my stuff. god! Terror of the Peace. <laughs> <laughs> it's so brutal. <laughs> if you want to tap with the Terror of the Peaks, which you shouldn't have, but you're here. You can target Terror of the Peaks. You make two Terror of the Peaks. They, they see all see each, each other. other. This one sees both. <laughs> and then I started blasting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's freaking sweet. What I liked was Markov Enforcer. This is a six mana vampire that says whenever it or another vampire enters the battlefield under your control, Markov Enforcer fights up to one target creature and opponent controls. And then whenever a creature dealt damage by Markov Enforcer this turn dies, make a blood. So now like... So they see each other too. So yeah. they fight... And then they fight again. Yeah. And then the first one fights too. Sees, sees the other two. So yeah. I think it's seven all told. I don't know. You, yeah. They might die by the end if you're not careful, but you'll take out a bunch of creatures and make a bunch of blood. Absolutely. That's pretty sweet. Which is really, really cool. Uh, Port Razor is the big one, I think. Yeah. Or Bloodthirster, which is yeah. similar. So these are extra combats. And the mm -hmm. thing about Port Razor is you'll untap with it, attack again. It will still have Myriad from the first time, but it'll create new tokens that don't count as the first port raiser and mm. trigger more extra combats. Yeah, I mean you can just keep making like the 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 myriad tokens aren't going to have myriad because that's not a copyable effect. Right. But you still get to attack with the main one, get two, two more, more, untap them. Untap, attack, attack with the main one that somebody else and, and the two more. And the other ones. Untap them. And then you do get the myriad off the original one, so you yeah. get two more there. You're not infinite turns because now at this point the first one can't attack anybody, right? It's already attacked the first three. It players. has to attack the other person. So yeah. you get three attacks. But you have all of these port razors that like but, give you additional combats when they deal combat damage. Yeah, and the new ones created new combats. Yeah. And then by the time the first one can't attack, there's still some that can. Right. And then, you know, like I said, I don't think you're infinite there on attacks, but you're a lot and probably everyone's It's a lot. Yeah. yeah. If you if you can attack that many times, that seems uh, really, really strong. Um, uh, my big question with this card is because there's definitely cool things that it does, is what kind of commander does this go in? Because blue, red, blink isn't necessarily something we've seen a ton of. Yeah. I think your commander, uh, well, you just want a bunch of ETB effects right, in yeah. your deck. I think it would just have to do with how many creatures in your deck have mm. an ETB, right? Like, yeah. Or have an, it doesn't have to be ETB. It could be having on attack or on, uh, no, not on attack. Not on attack. On damage. Right. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, doing this on a on a professional face breaker is absurd. Yeah. Oh boy. Because now they all trigger. Yeah. Oh, and you made six. Three, six, nine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Nine treasures. Oh Seems boy. okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I really liked Sahili the of uh, the sun's brilliance. I think this was kind of an underrated commander from Ixalan that just makes a token copy of a thing on the battlefield. So you're already going to have a lot of ETB creatures. It makes tokens, means you, you have good ways to use that. I've also seen Hinata Dawn Crown mm. as a really cool blink commander. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I really like that card. It's not not yeah, broken or anything. We haven't even talked about overloading it. Yeah, I, that's, that, yeah. that's just one creature. Yeah, yeah. every <laughs> once in a while you're gonna be, draw it and be like, hmm, oh, this is gonna be nuts. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna attack with five things and make two copies of just, each of them. Just double, yeah. triple your board. Yeah, yeah, pretty sweet. Uh, the next one is one of the guaranteed cards. He's one of the evidence cards. It's Mastermind Plum. Not Professor Plum. He's the Mastermind. Two and a black for a legendary creature human wizard. He, when he attacks, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. If it was an artifact card, uh, well, if an artifact card was exiled this way, you create a treasure. Whenever you cast a spell, if mana from a treasure was spent to cast it, you draw a card and you lose one life. Ooh, this is like a weird mono black reverse prosper. Reverse Prosper. That is what it is. You know is. what I mean? Yeah. Because Prosper says prosper. every time you cast a spell from exile, you get a treasure. This says whenever you when use a treasure, you draw, you draw a card. card. You have to have an artifact in the graveyard to get this going with him, but I guess you just create treasures in other ways. Yeah, I think this just goes in a tre- treasure deck. Yeah. Like if you have, it goes it, in a Prosper deck for yeah, sure. I, it goes in a Corvold deck. This is, it doubles your Corvold like treasure triggers, basically. Yep. I mean, you do have to be careful how you spend your treasure, like if you use one treasure per spell, kind of. But uh, the main combo I wanted to talk about was Storm Kiln Artist. Oh, boy. So now yeah. you cast one, make a treasure, draw a card, cast uh, one, make a treasure, draw a card. Storm Kiln Artist, so good. So good. A little too good. Yeah, I agree. You are losing <laughs> life with Mastermind Plum, but your Storm Deck, go for it. I think you're fine. You'll yeah, be fine. I think you're fine. <laughs> All right, one more card. Uh, oh. This card is very good. It is so good. All right, it's Suppressor Skyguard. Two blue white for a 2 4 human knight with flying. It says, whenever a player attacks you, if that player has another opponent who isn't being attacked, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to you this combat. So in a four-player game, if they don't have three creatures, they can't deal combat damage to you because they can't possibly be attacking all three Mm. players at once. And even if they have three creatures, if they don't attack all three players, they can't deal combat damage to you. Yeah. So if at the very least it says at least two of your creatures can attack me if you have, you know. And very often you just don't have a board that can deal combat damage to me. Right. Right. I mean, and then in addition to that, this is a 2-4 flying blocker. So, like, if they attack you with their third creature, it has to be bigger than a 2-4. Yeah, because if they have a 2-2, a 5-5, and, you know, a 2-1, they can't really send all... Yeah, they can send the 5-5 at you. They send the 5-5 at you and the other two is elsewhere, but, like, you know, they have to divvied up that way to mm-hmm. deal to have a hope of dealing any damage any to you. damage to you it's it's really really tricky and it, it, this is the kind of deck that's just going to have a low board presence and be like I, this is going to be my speed bump to not die to to aggro and that's enough like if you have to have a removal spell to have a hope of dealing chip damage to a player that's really really tough you just don't chip at them at yeah, all you chip at the other players you're like we will deal with you later yeah I'll try and deal with you all at once at some point later. But that's what these type of decks want. Cool, because all I need is time. All I need is time. Yeah. Yeah, it it says that basically if you're playing an aggro deck, you're like, all right, I have to remove a player so that it's easier to attack this person. And that's exactly what an Azorius deck wants you to do. Oh, so you remove them, and while you're doing that, I will make it so I'm completely untouchable, yeah. It's worth noting that in the late game, like if if you're doing a big green overrun attack, this card obviously doesn't really save you because usually they'll have enough damage to take out the whole table at once. But it does make the math really, really hard because now you can't just swing all out, take out the player who's easy, likely you, because you're low on board. Yep. You really are inoculated from like a big, suddenly scary, singular yeah. thing too, mm-hmm. which does happen where like, you know, they get out one thing, like steel Eldrazi style thing, and you just aren't touchable by that scenario with yeah. this out. Yeah. 
it's going to be super annoying. It's going to be super annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, this is the type of card that you get it out and you're just sort of guaranteed yourself to get to the later part of the game. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be targeted, you know, by at least attacking. Yeah. Uh, you know, not not forever, but I'm pretty safe for the next couple of turns. Yeah. yeah. This is also a knight, so it's really good in the new knight deck that can reanimate knights from the graveyard. Oh, Every geez. time this dies, Well, it's in blue and white, back. too. That's what I was yeah. thinking is, like... You cast it, and like if they have a little bit of mana up, you're not removing it. Like they, they yeah. know they they know I protect this thing, I don't die. Yeah. So that's that becomes their game plan. Protect mm-hmm. this until I'm ready to make my move. Yeah, it's, that's how uh, I play it. It's really really powerful. It, it it's not like it's more. I don't know. It's more innoc. It, it's less innocuous than a ghostly prison, but it's that level of card. Is ghostly prison uh, propaganda? It's a that super kind of pillow fort card for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. That's it. Those are the cards that we're going to talk about in this episode. But before we go, we want to talk about our favorite ones from this set and the clue set. We mm-hmm. threw in a couple of extra ones as well. Uh, Josh, you sort of hinted at your favorite, as did I, I suppose. Yeah, corporeal projection. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I think card sweet. Yeah. It's exactly my style of card too. Like it's going to do a cool thing. I'm going to get a lot of value off of it, but you don't have to stick your neck out very far. It's two Mm -hmm. mana. It's a sorcery. And then it does have that overload mode, which like once in a while, I'm going to just blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is fun "Ah." too. It'll be, I like every once in a while I'll play a card and be like, I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Here we go. Let's find out. But I'm pretty sure I'll win because of it. Like, but I just didn't, I didn't walk through the entirety of what's going to happen. Like, mm-hmm. it's going to be a lot and probably to the point where I win. And if I don't, whatever. Yeah, we'll figure yeah, it out. <laughs> that, that's that kind of card for sure. So good with extra combats. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what's your favorite card? It's Prisoner's Dilemma. <laughs> I love making my opponents do puzzles. <laughs> that's why I play Stacks in CDH. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I just think it's, it's very fun to put your opponents in, in positions where they're like, well, I have an opportunity to maybe do 12 if I do the thing and get it. Dang it! Uh, <laughs> and, and, and then you flash it back just to add insult to The flashback on it's brutal. It's so brutal. Because it's going to capitalize on all the fissures that were created by yeah. snitching on each other the first time. Exactly. That's what I love about it is they're going to be like, no, you snitched on me last <laughs> time. Yeah, like you're, And you're just over like, <laughs> I think none of this. <laughs> I definitely want to find a sl- slot for it in my Dragon's Approach deck, and that is pretty hard for me to do these days. So I want to uh, give a shout cool to puzzle. Final Ward Phantom, which was yeah. my backup, uh, awesome. my backup favorite card. By the way, yeah. I'm looking right now for most powerful, which is the next, yeah, uh, which I didn't think ahead, and you did. So I, okay. That's okay. I cheated. I cheated a little bit. I do think, like, because we didn't talk about it in this episode, I do think the most powerful card in the 99 is going to be Delny Streetwise Lookout. That's the white creature that doubles little creature abilities. I had that in a limited deck, too. Uh, it's really, really, really busted. <laughs> yeah. um, and we just talked about it in the Commander episode. So, um, You think that's more powerful than Crime Novelist? I think so, yeah. Hmm. I think, yeah, it's close. I think I would say crime novelist, but our patrons picked crime novelist. Oh, yeah. Our patrons slammed crime novelist. It was like 50% they voted for crime novelist, and the next closest was trouble in pairs from our patrons. Um, what did you pick besides Delny then? Yeah. I, I Of the ones that we talked about, I definitely thought about the Forensic Gadgeteer. I think that card's very, very good. I think that's my pick. Um, my favorite, I, I th- the, for the most powerful, at least in the kind of decks that I like to play, is Connecting the Dots. Yeah. I think it's a brand new effect. It's going to be really, really powerful in a lot of decks, and I'm curious to see just the ways it kills me. Because <laughs> it feels like there's a lot of different decks that can really utilize this kind of thing. Yeah, to be clear, I do. I agree with Crime Novelist. I think it probably is just raw, the raw power of it mm. is probably the, at, at its most. Mm. But I do like Forensic Gadgets here a lot, and I think it's pretty close. Yeah, what I like about Forensic Gadget here and is is it provides the whole engine, yeah. right? Where it's like, well, we'll give you the cards and we'll give you the things and you you got artifacts, we got artifacts. You That's my kind of card. Want cards? We <laughs> yeah. give you cards. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I don't yeah. have to do a lot. Yeah. There's just a little bit going on with it and I'm going to be able to take advantage. Yeah, Absolutely. Crime Novelist is definitely a hold in hand, hold in hand, hold in hand, play, win. Yeah, for sure. And when in that scenario, it's going to always feel like the most powerful. Right. Yeah. All right, to the listeners, what do you think about this set? Uh, are you excited about it? One new card slot perfectly into your existing commander decks. What are you slamming uh, into your favorite deck? We always like to hear. 
I feel uh, like this was one of the higher powered in the 99s we've done in a while. I agree. There's a lot of cards that I was like, that is going to see, we're going to see that. We didn't even mention here at the end the the white um, removal spell. Yeah. We didn't, like, there's I think a, that card's great. Yeah. There's a number of cards that are going to be staple like, mm-hmm. are good enough to be staple that we didn't even talk about at the end. So, yeah, I think there's... There's a lot of juice in this one. Yeah. yeah. If you want to pick up any juice, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. Card Kingdom has a huge selection of magic cards. The The cards that we talked about today, they come in the clue product. They come in all of the pre-cons. They come in the main set. Uh, and you can get the sealed product at Card Kingdom, or you can pick up exactly the singles that you're looking for there as well. Listen to the prof. Buy singles. Yeah. It's uh, especially with this, like a lot of the cards we talked about for, with, like there's like three or four from the blame game one, but there was also one in the deep clue C1. One, get the cards you want to get and make sure that like you don't have a ton of extra cards laying around. If you have a play group and you're going to play the clue version of the game one night as a novelty, I That's think that sweet. would be fun. Yeah. But like, yeah, if you're not going to do that, then order the singles. Don't buy the whole clue product just to get the three cards out of there you want. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's some cool cards in there. Get the, exactly the ones that you're looking for. And then, of course, once you get those cards, you want to protect them. You want your cards to stay in pristine condition so they retain their value. Ultra Pro is the game accessories brand that we treat that we trust our own collections to here at the Command Zone. If you go to ultrapro.com slash command, you can find all of the latest accessories, deck boxes, play mats, sleeves, they got dice, Mm -hmm. they got wall scrolls. Oh, the keyword counter dice are back. Yes. They they just restocked them. Yeah, which are sweet. The keyword counter dice are very, very sweet. I mean, Ultra Pro has what you need to sort of make your battlefield look awesome and also to make sure that all your game pieces, they stay safe and secure. Uh, We're traveling to MagicCon Mm -hmm. here very, very soon. It's always really important to me when traveling with my cards, you know, there's a lot of value in your cards and you don't want anything to fall out of your pack or to get jostled and bent, you know, and definitely Ultra Pro makes the products because they've been around for so long that they, you know, have the quality that nothing's yeah. going to happen to your stuff. It's a really important peace of mind to have. Absolutely. Before we go, we're going to say thank you to our, to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Thank you to Damon Lentz, Eric Lem, Megan Yip, Garab Galati, Jordan Pridgen, Jamie Block, Arthur Metacroft, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Sam Waldo, Evan Limburger, Katie Cole, Miss Trafford, and of course... Jimmy Wong. All right, everybody. Thanks Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Peace. (laughs) Catch up. (laughs) Catch (laughs) up. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>